All right, how we doing, guys? Hello, hello, hello. He welcome, everybody. Welcome. Today, we are doing a new type of stream. It's called Showtime. Uh, and this one's going to be a little bit different from the usual. I'm sure a lot of you guys notice no music, no special display, nothing, you know, crazy today. But I'll get into that in a second. So as we're starting out the stream today, I just wanted to welcome our first guest. Very, very happy to have him. The coach himself, King Recon. Welcome aboard, brother. How you doing? Dude. I'm honored to be the first guest, man. I appreciate you for uh, for not only reaching out, but for obviously having me on. It's something that I think we've been building towards for quite some time. Yeah. So I can't wait to talk about greatness awesome. and uh, just to catch up, man, because it's been a minute. For sure. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for being here. I'm very glad to have you. Um, so before we get into it, I guess I'll explain what we're going to be doing today so the chat is on the same page. Uh, basically, you know, with the usual streams, I always do this sort of like game show kind of like crazy high intensity event sort of thing get the chat involved with like scoring and all this stuff and sometimes you know when i've been doing those streams i've always felt you know i just want to kind of sit down with another youtuber pick their brain just have a, like a regular conversation kind of just get to know what's you know what what you've been thinking about with the story not just one piece related but like in general youtube other things whatever you're into i wanted to get into that and kind of like learn more about you um and what we would do today is basically have that discussion. And I feel like with a lot of collab streams, one of the things that happens is there's a lot of questions that pile up in the chat, a lot of super chats that pile up. And oftentimes we have to like break the flow to get to the super chats and answer what people are asking. And I wanted to kind of remedy that with um, this format by, you know, I would ask you a question, kind of like question and answer style, I'll give you a question, answer it, feel free to come back at me with a question if you have one. Uh, and then in between each of those rounds, we'll kind of like let the chat ask a question and then we'll answer, you know, a question in the chat. Obviously, super chats will get preference when it comes to like the order of the questions that we get to. Um, but aside from that, it's pretty much just going to be me and you, you know, shooting the shit for, for a little while. So if that sounds good to you, like a great time. Perfect. Oh, it's a great time. <laughs> cool. Cool. I got, I got to give a shout out to Brandon King, who gives a great comment that says the emu collab, the hidden <laughs> king collab. That's great. <laughs> I love great. that. Yo, shout outs <laughs> to Brandon King. He's always in here. He's a he's a real homie. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here, guys. I see a lot of familiar faces in the chat. So just want to say what's up to all of you. Um, and why don't we just get right into it? So Recon, I, I feel like, uh, you know, you've been around longer than I have. I haven't had the time to get as acquainted with like your opinions on everything. So I just want to start from like the basics uh, and also a little bit of your history. So tell me a little bit about how you got into One Piece in the first place. Dude. So, uh, just like a lot of people, I got into it through Toonami originally. Um, Was that the four kids I stuff? Just, right, with the four kids stuff. <laughs> I still have the Scholastic. As a matter of fact, hold on, let me pull it up real quick. Uh, oh, that's I, hype. <laughs> I still have the Scholastic Book Fair. Pull it next to Yeah, there we go. Yep. Oh, man. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> The is elastic book fair for kids stuff is there anything interesting <laughs> in there that would be like like have you do you, do you uh, remember anything from that book see. that was a little wacky i'd be curious to see no, how it's that... off my head okay i'd have to reread it i'd have to reread it yeah that's <laughs> cool though <laughs> yeah. and you got I into they it still call him zolo in this version <laughs> yeah. they still they call do. him zolo in the viz so they still call him zolo yeah that's true that's true <laughs> How to, so, so you got into it through the four kids. Did that deter you at all? Like, did that make you like, you didn't see any of the issues with it or. It, it, it did for, for a while because I, I thought it was an enjoyable show, but I didn't like get super into it at the time. I was huge into Naruto, huge into right. Dragon Ball and, and all that stuff. But, uh, when I got into it again, um, you know, just trying to find a show to watch, uh, and my ex at the time, she was like, yo, there's a show that you really like there's a character in the list like ichigo <laughs> and and at first i was like who in the world could that possibly yeah. be uh and then it, it ended up being zoro which she was right it is it, it's, it's my vibe the clouds of the world the zoros of the world the ichigos of the world I'm like <laughs> all right that's that, that that's my vibe so um i got into it that way and i just i, I fell in love with it so much bro because it, it's when i got into it that that allowed it to resonate so much because obviously I saw what I saw whenever I was younger and I really enjoyed it, but I just, the, the adventure aspect, uh, Luffy as a character, the, the straw dynamic felt very JRPG mm -hmm. where I, like, I, I was so used to 
playing these games and going through the towns and recruiting your characters. That's literally yeah. what One Piece is, and I just fell in love with it from the start. But it was really Jaya, Skypea, and uh, Water Symphony's Lobby that made me a fan forever. So I was like, I should say Arlong Park made me a fan forever. But those two kind of like solidified it mm-hmm. just um, uh, forever and ever. But I, I have a lot to, to thank it for because I feel like without without one piece i would never have found the career path that i wanted like before one piece hidden i'm not gonna lie to you i wanted to be a sports broadcaster okay i wanted to go into wwe commentary i was like dude there was a lot of stuff maybe into gaming or Uh something like that but because i got into the series i was like bro i want to make people feel what this makes me feel you know what i mean i wanted to i wanted to talk about not just one piece but also write something that can make somebody feel what this series makes me feel i I was like it really was just the greatness that I was like, all right, man, I got I got to pivot and choose a different career <laughs> path. And so I have a lot to thank the series for, but but th- that's the origin story in regards to what um how I found it and how I ended up here. And I'll tell you this, bro, I I, I think Watch OP as well as the Kaizuka fan subs with like the colored subtitles mm-hmm. uh, from 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 back in the day oh, because yeah. I just. It, it, it differentiated the series from all the other things that I was watching. So, like, just seeing Luffy's attacks go from green to red was just the rawest thing yeah. ever to be. So I have to... <laughs> I agree. <laughs> That's, um, you know, it's it's just... I, I love the series, man, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it continues to keep us all invested the way that it has for the past, God, 12, 13, 14 years. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. I like that you mentioned the well first off I just want to say you would kill it in sports broadcasting like I feel like you have the the personality <laughs> like the the personality the hype you have a very good like candor like when you're when you're getting excited about stuff you know a lot of people will just like start like going crazy shouting but like you have a good way of expressing your hype that gets other people hyped and i feel like i've noticed that like whenever i see people like posting the the clips of you popping off over a chapter like that that resonates with me too and i i I feel like uh i have pretty similar reasons for why i I started making one piece content was because to a degree yeah i wanted to help other people like see my perspective like what i felt from the series i wanted to kind of share that with other people maybe make them feel a similar thing um, but I do want to say I, I do really jive with the, the JRPG party thing because I've always thought that. And when I've explained it to people, I've always said like, you know, it's kind of like recruiting a new party member in an RPG. Like you go to the new island, you have a little mini story there, you get a new member of your party and you bring them on. They have their own, they have their own stats, they have their own abilities that the, you know, exactly. I, I love that. I love that. Exactly. I, I, I believe in that for real. Um, but yeah, I think that's, uh, what, what, what about you? I want to, I'm curious on how you got into one. So I, I, I watched the four kids dub when I was young. I watched up to about the end of Alabasta, I think, um, if I remember correctly. And then I started watching the subs online. And I kind of just fell off around Skypea because I was like a kid with low attention span. And I didn't realize what filler arcs were. So I was also pushing through every piece of filler as it showed up in the anime. Uh, and then once I got into like Skypea, I kind of just dropped it and never got back to it. Not because I didn't like it, but I just got sidetracked and, you know, I was a kid. Uh, so then years later, it's funny, I was in uh, early college and my friend was telling me who was really into One Piece. He was like, dude, you got to you got to try One Piece. So I was like, oh, I tried it back in the day. It was OK. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very long. I was one of those people that was like, oh, it's too long. It's too long. I can't get into it. <laughs> and uh, I was very stubborn. I was really stubborn about it. I was like, man, I just can't. It's like a, a big investment. And, uh, you know, he kind of gave up on pushing it to me after that. But then, like, I think within the next year, I decided to just on a whim sit down and rewatch, like, the old episodes. I was like, you know, I want to check One Piece out again. I was, uh, I was going through something in my life where I was in... I don't want to say depressive state, but like I was definitely in like a a low where I was like not the most self-confident. I was kind of like staying indoors all day. I wasn't doing much with myself. And I was like, okay, one night I was just, I needed to pick me up. So I just put on one piece. I started watching. And from there, I mean, the rest is history. I got hooked pretty quickly. I got to say by Arlong Park, I was in it. And then- What really sold me was Water 7. I didn't know anything about Water because I had gotten up to Skypea, so I knew nothing about what happened after. I get to Water 7, had no expectations, 
and it it blew me away. I remember there was one, and like I was watching the episodes in such like bulk, like uh, mm -hmm. you know, like there was one night I think the end of NES Lobby. I had watched like thirty episodes. <laughs> like I without getting up <laughs> i believe yeah and, how good that arc is I believe oh it. man i remember staying up it was maybe six or seven a.m i had not slept that night and i just stayed up through the whole cp9 fights like s series of fights and then i got to luffy's jet gatling at like 7 a.m and if i could take that moment and condense it down into like liquid form I think that would be more potent than any caffeine. I'm drinking coffee right now. That would be more potent than anything in this cup. Like I, that, that woke me up. I, I was up. I did not sleep yeah. the rest of the day. I was just thinking about like Luffy versus Lucci. That was on my mind right. all day. And after that, I was hooked. Like I, I was not dropping the series ever again. <laughs> so yeah. I, I can tell you that in regards to my friend group, um, after my boy Josh got into it, cause I was trying so hard to get so many of my friends. That's actually how, why it was so easy for me to get into the YouTube side of things because there was this girl in my uh, English class that always bothered because she was the only One Piece fan that that I knew that I was like really really into it. Uh, so every single day when I was uh, getting to like I don't know Drum Island or Alab Alabasta, I'd always bother. I'd be like, Yo, this is where I'm at right now. Like <laughs> this is crazy. This is insane. And I'm so glad I had her as an outlet before I started the the channel and stuff because man, I was going crazy. That's honestly why I started a YouTube channel is to have or multiplied by however i just really wanted to talk about the series mm -hmm. and um and to get to the point i was trying to get to is uh when i when josh finally got into it the episode re we rewatched the most every time when i went to his house is 309 the jet gatling <laughs> yep uh, against luchi oh. it's just it's an iconic episode bro it's just like you said you condense how you feel watching that episode and you can truly like the caffeine is just through the roof bro it's when... just, you, you could stay up for multiple nights in a row man oh man like Luffy getting knocked onto his back feet and then not falling over and then just getting back up. And then you get the Come flashbacks, on. the flashbacks yes, of Robin. Bro. Oh my, yes. there's nothing like that. I, I, I never got anything like that in any other piece of fiction. I feel like that I read nothing that, that hit that mood for me. Like that kind of like right. triumph overcoming the odds fighting, you know, some really evil force and just like, powering through at the last possible second it, it was the hypest thing i've ever seen so yeah. honestly in in the one piece series there's not that many moments that stack up to that one in particular for me i've definitely had like high points uh mm -hmm. later on like uh dress rosa you know the the king kong gun was also another one but nothing hit quite like the end of Ennius lobby for me um but it was i mean that's that's what i always tell people trying to get into it is like get up to this get up to this moment and then if you're if you're not about it after that like then you know, it's not for you, but if you can make it, I know it's like the meme, right? Like, Oh, just only watch 300 episodes. Then you'll get it. <laughs> but like, yeah. it's, it's kind of true. Like that's where it all comes together. It is, it is like, and, and the shorter version of that obviously is up to episode 37. Yeah, Cause once you get to Arlong park, I feel like Oda found his stride in Baratier. He found his structure. He mm -hmm. found the way that he executes character moments. Uh, so many things he discovered there, uh, the shocking plot twists and stuff of that nature. But in Arlong park, it like, he found out how to make that his own. And um, and so that's always my thing. Like, at least try to get to episode 37 and, yeah. uh, and see how it goes. But luckily, there's a lot of individuals, especially now, that get into it through the manga. And they seem to enjoy it almost right off the bat, at least recently. Uh, I, I don't know I don't know why that is. Because uh, I know in, in our generation, and even beforehand too, it took a while for people to get into the series. Like, asked Arlong Park to Alabasta or uh, even Water Symphony's Lobby. But I feel like nowadays I've seen people, like I said, maybe it's due to the manga or maybe it's due to the difference in expectations and me being in the booktube community side of things uh, a lot more nowadays. But I, the people that I see getting into One Piece now, like they immediately get it yeah. uh, right off the bat. It's it's very interesting how how that plays off nowadays. At least. Yeah. Um. You know, I want to ask you actually, because you mentioned BookTube, and I, I couldn't help but see on your Twitter you mentioned that you're an author. So, could you tell us a little bit about that, like your experience with writing, and like you know where? Dude, where... You got me so excited. Oh yeah, I, I, I love because I'm <laughs> yeah. working on I'm working on something myself. I'm trying to get into writing, so I'd love to hear like What's... your side of it. Yeah, that's so dope, dude. Well, first of all, we, we got to talk about that either on or off. Or it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Sure. Um, to to get into that later, but 
Um, so yeah, for me, that's what I was talking about earlier in regards to how One Piece helped me because I was very similar to what you were talking about there with um, with a low point. Like I genuinely didn't know what I want to do with my future, and um, and I had so many different options available to me. And when I when I discovered the series, they made it so crystal clear. I want to make someone else feel what this series makes me feel, and um, and, and since I was a kid, I always loved it. Like I remember when I was growing up, I would like, I loved Sailor Moon a lot when I was a kid. So I would like um, make my own Sailor Moon episodes and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, make my own Ed and Nettie episodes. Yeah, because uh, I just I just really enjoyed writing and um, and so I kind of let go of it. I I continued to write, but I didn't think it was ever go- going to amount to anything until this series hit and for the past since i got into one piece so like the past like 12 13 years um god no i think it's been longer than that <laughs> uh for uh, ever since uh, I, I got into the series it's um it's been the one thing i've been going towards so i've been working on this one long story for quite some time but while i'm working on that i'm doing other shorter things working on other books as well just trying to continue to get better at the craft and um and hopefully get one of these works published even if it's not the big one that i always wanted to get published i've gotten to the point now in my writing journey where i just love doing it so much that i hope that i'm able to share this with other individuals someday and that's something that uh going back to school helped me out with a lot because going back to school helped me crack that shell of of, um kind of like when i first started youtube it's like it's kind of daunting to start this new uh endeavor in this new journey and um Going back to class sort of helped me break that shell because you have to. You have to share your work with the teacher, yeah. the other individuals in the classroom. And that's been a great experience for me. And so I feel like I've grown a lot as more individuals critique the work and allow me to progress forward in that way. And so it's 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 the love of my life. Um, it's the reason why I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to this series for opening my eyes. I'm like, this is what I actually love doing. And... Um, and ever since then, everything that I do, everything that I am, everything that I consume, uh, whether it be video games or even wrestling or sports or anything, I see it through the lens of wanting to create something that can make someone feel the same thing One Piece makes me feel someday. And I hope to be able to accomplish that. But like I said, at this point, I, I just I love writing so much that even if I never get to be on the level of the people that I uh, aspire to be like, just being able to do this until I die would be the most satisfying thing to me. I think at this point, that's uh, that's what's getting, that is what's changed from when I started. Like when I started, I had these big aspirations and, and dreams. And I still have those for sure. Uh, but I, I just, I fell in love with the craft so much where it could amount to literally nothing. And I've already had enough satisfaction for a lifetime. And um and I just I love it a lot, but I'm curious on I, on on your journey, dude. Like, how is your uh, how, how's your writing experience? It, it's always cool when I get to meet other individuals who are going through this endeavor. Yeah, well, um, well, first off, I just want to say that connects with me a lot because I feel very similarly. Like, I, I've talked about this. I've had people ask me on stream, you know, about like how do you get good at something? You know, I feel like I'm not stacking up to the people that I admire, so on and so forth. And I've always said like it shouldn't be about meeting the level of whatever piece of fiction or whatever that you're striving towards. It shouldn't be about that. It should be about love for the craft. You know, Oda may have a lot of respect for Toriyama. He said that, for example, you know, Dragon Ball was like a huge inspiration for One Piece. But I don't think his goal when writing every chapter of One Piece was, I have to meet the level of Toriyama. He wrote One Piece because he had a story he wanted to tell. He wanted to make people feel something. He really loved it. And I think he's been working weekly for all these years, decades, because he loves it. That's really what it comes down to. So I think, you know, you you saying that definitely resonates with me because I try and get myself into that mindset all the time. Like, do things because you like to do them, not because you feel like you have to do them to meet some expectation or to meet some level that you want to strive towards. Obviously, that'll come. Um, there was one... It's a, It's a little... A little bit unrelated in terms of like the application of it, but there was one clip I was watching from Akira Kurosawa, famous uh, director. He he spoke about, you know, the writing process and he talked about how, you know, if you were to just sit down every day and just try and write something, even if you weren't able to come up with the best stuff, even if you weren't able to, you know, cook for the entire day straight – 
by the end of the day, you'll still come out of it with maybe one or two pages of something at least. And if you do that every day, eventually, you know, not before, before not very long, you'll have a hundred pages of, of something. You'll have 200 pages of something. And I feel like a lot of people, you know, don't really put like frame it that way. They like a lot of people jump into things and I'm guilty of this too. I've done it, you know, with, mm -hmm. with my own writing, uh, where I try and jump in and I try and get the big picture right from the beginning. And it's like, I want to have everything kind of set, set up in my head. Cause th that's the way I imagine Oda does it. Like I just picture Oda and I'm like, Oh, this guy has 50 notebooks filled with notes of every character, every interaction, everything he wants to do ready to go. And then he's cooking up chapters weekly. And I don't think you need to have that. You have to have maybe like some base outline, but aside from that, it's all about just chipping away at it, building up something yeah. and, and adding to what you already have. Um, so with my writing, like right now I'm working on, I have a bunch of ideas. I have a notebook. Anytime I have a good book idea or story idea, I write it down and I'm like, let me see if I can expand on this later. Uh, and one that I've been working on, I've had this in the works for years since I was, uh, I was in film school. When I started college, I went to film school and I had these, mm. so to, to like kind of bounce off of what you said, you had these like dreams and goals when you were younger, like you wanted to do certain things. I wanted to be a screenwriter and, and director. Mm. And that's a pretty common thing. I feel like everyone in film school is like, oh, I want to be a director, screenwriter. Mm -hmm. I want to be Quentin Tarantino. Right. I want to be Stanley sure. Kubrick. Sure. <laughs> but like I was right. one of those kids. So I had my ideas yeah. and, um, for me, I always wanted to write this one story. I was super, super into Westerns and like specifically mm. spaghetti Westerns. Like I really love mm -hmm. spaghetti Westerns a lot. And mm -hmm. when I was younger, I, I wanted to write this spaghetti Western story. And then it was, it was pretty big in scope. So obviously it would have taken a lot to ever put it out in any way, shape or form. Uh, so I kind of like put it to the side. I, I didn't go to film school. I didn't finish film school. I ended up switching to business and then I kind of, put it in the background for years. Then I got into One Piece. And when I got into One Piece, the story was so engrossing and it like captured my imagination in a way where I was like, okay, maybe I want to try and rework this old idea that I had for a story. Mm. And I started to rework it and incorporate like fantasy elements here and there. I had like one draft idea, another draft idea, and I never settled on anything. And I kind of, once again, put it to the side for, for a few years. Gotcha. And uh, it was only recently that I, you know, working on YouTube that I was like, okay, I'm writing scripts for my videos like on a regular basis. I'm writing a lot of pages. I've written now cumulatively like hundreds of pages of one piece analysis and script. Why don't I just try writing about this story that I had in mind? Like, why not? Right. Uh, so I've been working at that this year. My goal for this year was to like actually put something to page and have some kind of concrete idea like that I can give to someone and be like, look, this is the story I've been thinking about. I have, I have it on pages now. Like you can actually read it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm working on that. I'm doing like a kind of like fantasy, dark fantasy, Western like elements mixed together. And it's a whole thing, but uh, that'll take, I don't want to. That wanna... sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. No, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to obviously take too much time from uh, the stream for that, but obviously, I, you know, oh, no, it's, dude, it's I a love very, it. I love yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It's... And, I'm, and I'm sure the audience is also feeling the passion right there, dude. I, I, I really like that. Awesome. <laughs> I, I appreciate you asking though. Cause it's like, I, I feel like I never get to talk about like my passion for that. And I, and I feel that from you too, like you have that passion for writing. So like, I, I definitely, mm -hmm. um, I, I respect that a lot. I think that's a, I think it's a cool thing that we're able to like be in the content creation space and then like also work on like other projects like this, like writing, and build other avenues for us to express ourselves. I think that's really, sure. really dope. For, um, sure. for sure. So let me uh, get to a question from the chat. I saw a good one from Portion of Torsion. For uh, The question is for Recon. How has the character uh, interactions that are so easily integrated into One Piece helped you with writing the characters in your book? Are there other pieces of fiction that have greatly helped? Oh, man, there's so many. Uh, but to answer the first part of that question, uh, absolutely. I, I was actually gonna uh, go off of your point earlier in regards to um, Oda and and how he looks at things on a grand scale and how he has like probably like sixty notebooks. And I think what makes Oda so great is how he's able to balance that and like the small scale stuff because you can tell that Oda's just a massive fan of obviously cartoon antics and classic cartoons. But I remember reading interviews when he was starting off 
and he just kept redrawing Disney uh, Renaissance films and classic Disney mm. movies because he was trying to capture that vibe, that aesthetic. But I'm sure while doing that, he must have recorded classic story structure in his mind over and over again while he's, you know, writing uh, or drawing, I don't know, Little Mermaid or uh, any of those things that were coming out at the time. And that's always left an impact on me because I'm sure that's how it is for any creative, right? If we go in and we're trying to be like our favorite creators and then our own personality, our own style, our own voice comes out of that. And in that regard, uh, because Toriyama and Oda's style um, have always resonated with me, that cartoony type of style, um, the character interactions in this series inspire me because Oda's not trying to be like The Wire or Breaking Bad or mm -hmm. something, right? Like he he's clearly understands what the story is. And a, a few, I think it was a few years ago, he talked about how he... He sort of centers his dialogue around like kabuki play structure where it's not really what they're saying but the tone in which they're saying it and like uh, the way in which the words are being said and i was like that's actually really fascinating um and it's that type of micro level stuff that when it matches with the macro it makes one piece work so well um and i think that's where the the character inspiration stuff really hits home and then the other part of it in regards to this series is how is he able to take classic fairy tales and odify it to to the point where I almost think of those more than I do the originals, like the Nutcracker and having that be a, such a prevalent part of Dress Rosa and um, uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Drum Island, uh, uh, Usopp, uh, and Pinocchio, and, and, and it's just like, it's so cool how he takes these things that we already know and odifies them in a way to where it feels like a brand new thing. And um, in that way, his characters and his ideas resonate with me on a really personal level uh and the interactions between the crew in particular like i talked about earlier um the jrpg thing that's what attracts me to the genre right that's why i love like final fantasy trails is the mm -hmm. party interactions i love the long stories i love the uh, the craziness that happens the plot twists and everything but at the end of the day it's the characters how they interact with each other how i can interact with them as somebody who's controlling them and in one piece how luffy interacts with everyone that he meets on these islands uh, no matter what it is, it's always the coolest thing. How Zoro and Sanji interact with each other, how Nami interacts with the entire crew, uh, Brooke's interactions with new characters. Like, there's just so many. And Oda just captures each individual character so well. And even if it's a character that shows up, like, three or four times in the story, he gives he gives them a quirk where you just can't forget them ever again, yeah. whether it's in design or their speech, whatever it is. And in that way, it's just unforgettable. Um if I could just talk about one piece of media sure. that has inspired me a lot besides One Piece, that would be Nisio Isin's Monogatari. It's a it's a novel that was turned into an anime. And there's, because it's written in first person, he's able to do the Oda thing of character quirks, but to like the 50th degree. And that's something I really enjoy about his writing and the way that Shaft animates those character quirks. Uh, is really cool for me because each character is immediately um, that's just differentiated. But that series exemplifies every sort of thing that you're not supposed to do from a writing standpoint, which is like not have the quote unquote archetypes, not have the quote unquote uh, like the in Japanese terms the yandere, the sundere, like mm -hmm. and that type of stuff. Um, Nisio Isin says, screw all that. I'm taking that to the 50th level. Have them be super young that is super soon today, but you're going to remember them because of that. I'm going to make them extremely original. And it's sort of going back to the Oda thing where we take this idea, this concept that we've known and we've known for a long time, but completely turns it on its head and or just exemplifies it in its own style. And that's where he creates and comes up with his voice. And in that way, that's extremely inspiring for me, especially when you think about how, like you said earlier, Oda himself being inspired by Toriyama and by all these other individuals, he found his own style while attempting to uh, reach those heights. And so, I uh, mean, because he loves the, uh, the story and the craft of writing as much as he does. And, um, yeah. and that's stuff that's really inspirational. Like, I think of when uh, a couple years ago, he talked about how uh, the Shanks Marine Ford scene, the BB scene, all that stuff wasn't planned. And originally, I was like, that's impossible. <laughs> There's no way. The right? BB scene, the Shanks scene, all that, the Shanks and Marineford scene, the final BB farewell, 
uh, the uh, supernova showing up at Sabaori, like all of that stuff was unplanned. But then I realized once uh, I continued down my journey as well is he's just so in tune with his own world and with his own characters. He knows them so well. And while he's writing, he's letting his hand and his pen do the thing. He's not even thinking about it at that point. He's like, yo, this is what Shanks would do if he was in the area. This is what Vivi would do with the Straw Hats. Like, it, it doesn't even have to be um, a foreshadowing thing anymore. It's like, this is what I feel in my heart these characters should do right now. And that's what they're going to do. And that's cost for some of the best moments in the series. That's really, really inspirational. Yeah, yeah no, for real. I mean, I, I've realized, honestly, like how much of Oda's writing just feels organic. And it's partially because I, I feel like he's very good at establishing the characters so that even the readers, without knowing what's going to happen next, we can also put together certain things just by knowing his characters. Like, that's how you know you've done a good job of writing characters. Like, the fact that they're, I don't want to say predictable, but you can kind of trace their actions to a way where, like, it comes to a logical conclusion what they're going to do next or what type of person they would be, what type of things they would do. Because, um, I don't know, there's a lot of fiction where I feel like the characters aren't that easy to follow. And it, it wouldn't be easy for me to theorize about, like, another series, for example. But with One Piece, I feel like theorizing is pretty... I don't know. I don't know how to call. It. I don't want to say just easy, but like it is easier than some other pieces of fiction I've read because Oda writes his characters in a way where they're very, um, they're real and they have patterns and how they behave. They have, yeah, yeah. They're, they're they're real characters. They have personality that's mm -hmm. organic. So I agree with that. And and you mentioned another series that you you know that you hold in high regard. I wanted to ask you actually. So you know you always talk about One Piece being peak fiction. What are some other yeah. examples? Not just in anime, not just in manga. It could be video games. Okay. It could be TV. Oh. It could be literally anything. Okay. What are some other examples of like peak fiction to you? Your your top of the top, you know? Oh yeah. Oh man, dude. <laughs> they didn't even get me started. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I want to hear it. I want to get started so for sure. There's there's so many, but off the top of my head, the ones that I hold in highest regard uh, with One Piece, uh, there's a video game series called the Legend of Heroes Trail series. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a very long. Have you ever heard of it? I have. Trail series. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's a very long um, JRPG series it started in 2004, um, and it's still going to this day. It's a series that's gone from the PC slash PSP until where we are right now on the PS5, and it's one long story, just like One Piece, where it starts off there. And it doesn't do, like, even though I love the anthology stuff like Final Fantasy does, which I'll talk, I'll talk about that in a second, mm -hmm. or like what Kingdom Hearts does, um, where uh, each game still has its own uh, thing going for it, where uh, you, you have to understand certain things and all this stuff. Like, And I love, I love Kingdom Hearts a lot, and that's another thing that I hold in the highest regard. But um, with Trails, it's so interesting because it genuinely feels like a shonen battle manga that's just playable. So, like, the thing I always use to sell people on it or attempt to sell people on it is imagine being able to play through One Piece of best, best arcs. That's literally what it feels <laughs> like. So, once once you get past a certain point, it feels like you're playing through Alabasta. You're playing through Water 70's Lobby. You're playing, like, actually physically playing mm -hmm. this stuff. And it's so cool how they're able to capture that. Um, and it's it's it has one of the greatest cast, my personal favorite cast of characters ever. Definitely one of the best. Um, and it's just the the attention to detail given to so many of those things is just out of this world. So I love Trails. I adore Final Fantasy. That's the reason I'm here, right? Like, I got into Japanese media through Final Fantasy VII, and literally I never looked back. <laughs> Sailor Moon, <laughs> yep. Gundam, Dragon Ball, everything. One Piece, I found that all thanks to FF7. So I, love um, I hold that in the highest regard. And the most recent uh, entry is probably my favorite game of all time. I loved it so much. Uh, obviously, 16? Kingdom Hearts, a lot of the other... Huh? Was it 16 was the oh, most? Uh, uh, rebirth. Oh, Seven Rebirth. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard yeah. great things. I played the first uh, the first remake, like, part, and that was awesome. Oh, yeah. Dude. Yeah. When you get the opportunity to get a Rebirth, mm -hmm. have you played uh, Infinite Wealth yet? No, or I haven't. I, I So I, okay. I still have to play Yakuza 7 because I, I, okay. I don't have Ichiban's story yet. Like, I, I've played the other – I've played all of Kiryu's games. I haven't played Ichiban's mm -hmm. games, so I want to do that before yeah. I get to Infinite Wealth. But, uh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Yakuza is definitely one that I hold in highest regard. So, like, hell yeah, a lot of those because I, 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 I really love what video games are capable of, and this, and the, as a storytelling medium, Metal Gear Solid, Kingdom Hearts, just 
Zelda, so many uh, the from software games. They just Bro. I hold them in the highest regard. Um, in in other mediums or even within uh, anime manga as well, uh, Evangelion means the world to mainly uh, because of how how it's able to communicate how the author feels through the screen, through visuals, through the characters. But more importantly than that, it was the, the piece of, of fiction that allowed me to understand that sometimes what the characters feel and what it makes you feel is more important than the overarching plot. And what I mean by that is when you get to the final episode of Evangelion, a lot of things will not be resolved. Mm -hmm. But Ano, que ano questions the individual who's watching this, does that matter? Is that something that should matter? Like, there's going to be individuals out there who leave unsatisfied, and that is okay. Because I want to reach the individuals that I really want to, I want this message to resonate with. And it was one of those, like, really interesting, I never really thought about a story being like that, where normally I, I would think, you would want to resolve all these plot threads, like what Oda's doing right now with this series, or you would want to have a lot of these things resolved because not it would feel very unsatisfying. And the final episode sort of shifted my perspective of that, where I was like, no, I'm, as, I'm okay with it not being resolved, as long as it's done well. Um, and I think it, uh, it sort of changed my whole perspective on that, and so I'll always be grateful to Evangelion and End of Ava genuinely rewired my brain chemistry that was that was an incredible experience yeah um i'm a huge fan of the uh, like i was talking about earlier with the disney renaissance films um, mm -hmm. i genuinely think they are masterful um the, the the disney renaissance era has some of the greatest stories and when i say that i mean stuff like uh a dragon ball for instance that and connect with an adult and a child at the same time because i don't think people understand how difficult that is to do I don't, I, it's it's so hard for anything to resonate with anyone it's very very difficult but to resonate with multiple generations of individuals and have them feel something is something that i'm really like wowed by when someone speaks of their experiences with toy story or ratatouille even though that's pixar um or any of those uh wally uh, any of those things where um, w when I when I hear individuals say these things and we come from different backgrounds, different places, and I'm like, no, oh, you feel the same thing I feel in this, or it hits you a little different. It's uh, though that that to me is like the greatest example of what I'm trying to do, which is create something that can resonate with with individuals on that base level. Obviously, if you dig into those films, there there's yeah. a lot of incredible messages and. And, and themes and stuff of that nature. But at the base level, they're really enjoyable films. And so the individuals just going into the cinema to experience something great, they're gonna get that out of it. A person who goes back and watches it five times is also gonna get something new out of it. And that to me is what makes those movies so special. Um, there, There's a lot of them. I have a lot of love for the four, first four seasons of Game of Thrones, obviously. I think they're absolutely masterful. Yes. Um, As well as the, the the novels. I think George is, is incredible. And I, we're still waiting. Still waiting for wins. Still, yep. Um, Two more books me? to go. Yeah, we're still waiting. <laughs> Two more books to go. Another another thirty years, uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's um, it, uh, those those are just a few of them, but uh, it's it's incredible how how many incredible stories there are that I've experienced, and how many more there are to experience, bro. It's just it's it's endless. You mentioned the wire it's earlier. Endless. Do you like the wire? Yeah. Oh, dude, I love, I love the, wire. the wire. I love, I love the, the wire. wire. I, love the I love Sopranos. Sopranos is amazing. Uh, Fantastic. I, I've I've honestly struggled. My top three for like TV dramas has always been Sopranos, The Wire, and Breaking Bad, and I can't figure out the order of like which one's Fantastic. my favorite. I I feel like it might be The Wire at my number one. I'm gonna be honest. I I think every season is good. I I haven't I don't have I don't have any problems with the show. I mean, yeah. I mean, well, all three of those shows are pretty much amazing start to finish. So it's really yeah. hard. But um, out of curiosity, just because I I love talking about the wire, I know it's not One Piece related, but I want to ask you: mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite character on that show? Omar. Omar. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Let's go. <laughs> it's gotta be. You feel let's me? Go. It's, it's gotta be. It's bro. gotta be Omar. So. Omar's yeah. great. Yeah. Is that yours too? Uh, he's in my top three. He's in my top three. I feel top like. Three? Okay. Well, what's your top three? What's your top three? <sighs> Omar is up there. Stringer is uh probably in my top three as well just because i don't want to get into spoilers for the sake of anyone who hasn't seen it but <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
I just I'll just say there's the moment where they're going through his apartment and uh mm. they they note the um McNulty notes the books that he was yes. reading. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. And there yeah. was that that whole like last sequence, you know, those, those that two episode sequence with Stringer and like leading up to that, probably one of the best things I've ever seen on television. Um Legendary. when when McNulty asked like who was this guy? You know, like who is this guy? Like, like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that that hit me in a in a kind of way. Um he's up there. I I also got to put this is a little bit of a weird pick, but I really like Slim Charles a lot. Okay. <laughs> I like okay. Slim Charles hey, I, a lot. I, I respect it. I respect it. Yeah, I feel like every time he's on screen, I'm like I'm like locked in just cuz I don't know, he 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 represents something in the show about like there there's an order to the way things happen on the streets and he's he plays by that order despite the fact that it's like a very dirty world where people kind of like one up each other, set each other up. He kind of, he has a code of honor as well. There's a lot of codes of honor in the wire. And I really, yeah. I really appreciate yeah. that. And those, those three characters specifically Stringer is kind of against the code of honor. He doesn't follow that code of honor, but then you have Omar and you know, like, so I, I like those characters a lot. I, I love that show. I uh, really love that show. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I need to give it a, another rewatch um like the, the the other day i was uh rewatching some sopranos episodes with some of my good friends like you probably know radman and mm-hmm. and jay and yeah. obviously uh, so like we were in in jay's discord watching that last year and i was like god i forgot how incredible this stuff <laughs> so is good. man like it's so good it's so good it's, it's so, so good. good my friends were watching sopranos like for the first time recently so i've been catching him like watching it and mm. it's like i had the same experience mm. i i get that reminder every once in a while that this is like this is peak this is truly like yeah. one of the best things yeah. um let's see if we have any uh any questions in the chat that we that i missed uh if not i got another one for you um i don't see anything off the off first glance so let me uh let me hit be, you be, be, before sure be, before you go just uh one question for you sure in regards to the in regards to the game stuff, I want to know your gaming history. Like, Ooh, do you have any okay. favorite games? And well, you mentioned Metal and, Gear. Uh, Metal Metal Gear is is amazing up greatest. there. I, I'll still yeah. I'll never forget the day that Phantom Pain came out, and I was installing it on my computer, and I was like up late at night. The Steam servers were like blocked up because everyone was installing <laughs> it at the same time, and I was like, man, yeah. just like let me play the game. Let me play the game. Mm-hmm. Um, I just had mm-hmm. Sins of the Father going on in my head. Like that that song is just amazing. Um, legendary song. Yeah, legendary. Uh, yeah, so Metal Gear is up there. Oh, I will just say about MGS Five. I'm a little bit disappointed by that game, though. I do have a little bit of pain in my heart. I, I think all of us are. Yeah, uh, and it's a it's a great game, but you, you can tell that final act was not there. Yeah, the act that was supposed to be there was not there. But, but you know what's funny about it? In a way, it kind of connects to the theme of the game, doesn't it? Like the Phantom it does. Pain. You're right. You know, like the pain yeah. of like an arm that's supposed to be there, but it's not. True. There's a final True. act that's supposed to be there, but it's not. And you it's get not. and it that's like straight up the theme of the game. So even though it probably that's wasn't true. intended by Kojima, it kind of like it's like a happy accident in a way where like we feel the pain that Venom Snake felt that that um Good point. yeah like you know like Miller felt you know so right. uh yeah Metal Gear is up there for me uh the FromSoft games are obviously in terms of like world building and storytelling I know a lot of people roast roast those games for like being too obscure like they kind of just like throw random names out there and expect the player to put it together but that's what i've always loved about it i love that there's yeah there's a world that we will never fully understand and these games are like a way for us to just like walk around in this world and learn a little bit about it but we weren't there for when like all these kingdoms in dark souls we weren't there for the height of those kingdoms we're just walking through the ruins so for me, yes. that's that's been a big influence on me with with fiction too. Like with my story that I'm writing, I I have this thing that I want to do where I have these like you know ruined kingdoms that you kind of get to explore, and you don't you get to put the picture together on your own, but you're you're never gonna get the true story. You kind of have to fill in the mm-hmm. blanks, and I always love that. Mm-hmm. I I thought that was a really yeah. cool. Um, me too. Yeah. Um, what other games? So like in my favorite. My favorite, one of my favorite games of all time, I've recommended this now a bunch of times on my channel, but it's like, uh, have you ever heard of a game called The Outer Wilds? I've heard of it and I want to play it because one of the individuals that I watch for, like um, Xenogears is one I didn't bring up earlier. It's another one that sort of rewired the way that I think. But uh, so there's a podcast called The Resonant Arc 
podcast, they do like a JRPG uh, analysis for the the stories. It doesn't have to be JRPGs, but they did like Metal Gear, they did Xeno Gears, uh, Final Fantasies, and they just recently covered Outer Wilds. And even though I didn't watch the podcast, I heard both of them come out of it saying it was for both of them one of their favorite games ever made. Mm-hmm. And immediately my mind went like, I know what these guys have experienced. And for them to say that, it has to be something really special. So sell it's, me on it. It's I'm, incredible. I'm so so it's, uh, it's a game you can only experience once. That's the caveat. Mm. Once you've played it and you know what, what the whole picture is, you can't go back to it and get that same experience again. Uh, so yeah. it's it's a like a literally once in a lifetime kind of experience that you can get. Um, but what makes it so cool, it kind of like ties into this theme of like, walking through the ruins and piecing a story together because that's what the, the story of Outer Wilds is. And it's, an, it's, a, it's a difficult game to pitch because I can't really tell you what makes it so good mm. without giving away, like, the, the thing, right? I love that. I, I love that because it's kind of like the Journey or Shadow of the Colossus thing where, or, or even Elden Ring or Breath of the yeah. Wild where even if, even if you talk about it, it doesn't matter. You have to experience it. You, you have to experience it. Okay, I get it. Yeah, so the best it. way I could describe it is, okay, so, like, Imagine you were an archaeologist like Robin, for example, and you were getting to explore, you know, a past civilization's history or, or the ruins, and uh, you're basically the guy reading the Poneglyphs. The whole game is basically essentially you reading the Poneglyphs piece by piece and putting together what happened. And it is a very, like, existential game. Um, it's a very... It's very poetic. It's beautiful. It has one of the best ending sequences I've ever experienced in a video game. Like truly, it, it, it had a mix of emotions. There was, you know, adrenaline. There was happiness. There was melancholy. It was just like everything all at once. And uh, I, it's like I'm I'm trying to figure out a way to pitch it that doesn't give away anything. Well, no, but yeah, right, like right, right, good. it's it's yeah, right, one of those good. games. I just have to say, you have to just one day just sit down play it and i think maybe about like 30 minutes or maybe within 30 minutes to an hour you'll be able to figure what the gameplay like figure out what the gameplay loop is and like what's going on uh and and i think it's very good at letting you what's good about the game is it's very open-ended so it lets you kind of like go through it in your own way everyone's adventure through the game is kind of going to kind of be different it's going to happen in a different order um so yeah so that's all i can say about that i just highly recommend it if you like the whole narrative in one piece of like the ancient kingdom and like reading the poneglyphs putting together this ancient mystery it's it's up your alley it it has elements of like 2001 a space odyssey in it interstellar like those types of things it is a it is a game the gate the setting of the game is in outer space you're an astronaut that's all i can say that's so cool yeah yeah so so cool i love both of those films uh, uh, both 2001 and interstellar so that's oh uh, you oh you will love it you will love it it's it has its own little simulated solar system that you get to explore basically uh, so it's very, very cool. Um, highly recommend that. Any other games? I mean, Yakuza, I love Yakuza. Um, oh, yeah. That's in my P-Fiction, it's, too. It's I amazing. Yakuza, Yakuza 2, everything in Yakuza 2 is is gold, in my opinion. Like, the everything leading up to the final fight. The final fight's amazing. I love Ryuji. Um, yeah, great game. Uh, Cyberpunk 2077 was one that I experienced pretty recently. And that was also, like, a pretty, like earth-shattering experience for me that story so yeah uh to basically like wrap up my list of games i i've played a lot of video games uh, right now i've been playing like pizza tower i don't know if you've heard of that one it's like totally yeah my brother plays that i love yeah. pizza tower so like <laughs> yeah so like i play a lot of video games um but like narratively those are the ones that really connect to me like story-wise those give me a lot of inspiration um so we got a, a ten dollar super chat from super scorpio 12 thank you for that brother he said uh I'm between yeah, between uh, Dragon's Dogma 2 and Lies of P, listening to uh, both amazing games. I've been playing Dragon's Dogma 2. It's really, really fun. Lies of P blew me away. Uh, listening oh, to a One Piece. Lies of P is so good. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, listening to a One Piece discussion. Calm day for a rainy Saturday. Question. Does Elbaf have a painting or sculpture of Nika? I think sculpture with painting of Joy Boy's crew. Oh, that's an interesting. Like, mm. Do you think it has like, yeah, like any like lore related art depictions and things like that? You know, I think so. Of uh, the reason why I say that is, there's been so many references uh, to the sun god, both in Skypea and in the Big Mom flashback. I think they need some sort of, re- of representation of that, of what it was supposed to be. So whether 
what like like Super Scorpio said, whether it's a painting or uh, or a story that was passed down to the generations, um, or some sort of statue, or even within the Saul Library, there could be something there that's like an emblem or something from that era, for sure, no question. Now, if there's like a painting of Joy Boy's crew, you know how hype that would be. Oh we man! We said the Iron Giant, Zunisha, Lily, Joy Boy, and then like a bunch of characters, silhouetted characters. You know, Oda loves the silhouettes. A bunch yeah. of silhouetted characters. Uh, I think that's a good opportunity for, for for some greatness there for sure. Yeah, I think that's uh, a good place to do it because you know there's like all those uh, Nordic like wood carvings where they had like the wood carvings oh. like of depictions and like really like old style um i don't know if they're all just paintings or wood carvings or what but like i could see them doing that where it's like not like a, a realistic picture of joy boy but like some kind of like artistic old depiction of him or something like that i could see happening i definitely agree i think there's there's no way like it's not a coincidence that oda saved this island for after everything else and like even after we meet vegapunk like vegapunk's the guy that knows like almost everything there is to in the world that's accessible to the public and we've met him we've seen the gorosei transform before we even get to see elbaf you know it's it's before we even know what loki looks like we've seen vegapunk and the gorosei transformation so it's like i can't believe it it's no coincidence to me. It's no coincidence that yeah. the main the, the main reason Luffy's out on the ocean, Shanks, it made his base of operations at Elbaf. Like, this has to be some kind of yeah. incredibly important location. So I completely agree there. No question. Um, no question. Yeah, it's, um, it's undoubtedly going to, uh, like you said, it's it's so important. It's the last one that Otis hyped up before, besides uh, La Laugh Tale. It's the last of the hyped up arcs, right? So yeah. Like, for years... We got uh, we had Fisherman Island hyped up. We had um, Wano hyped up, and now we're finally getting Elbaf. Like these are the three that Oda for sure had in mind. All the other two had crazy, crazy Void Sentry implication. Yeah. So for this one, we know for a fact. I mean, just based on this most recent chapter being titled what it, what it was titled, lets me know like when we get there, there is going to be a, a, a lore dump galore whether it's from Saul, whether it's just from the environment, like we're able to piece certain things together before we get the actual story ourselves. There's so many opportunities for Void Century greatness. And I know Oda, he wants to keep feeding us clues and different puzzle pieces for us to put the picture together before he gives us the full course meal. Yeah. So this will be his probably his last opportunity to do so is in Elbaf. How, how do you feel about Egghead right now? Like now that we're kind of like in the last stretch of the arc, do you like mm -hmm. where where would you place it on your list of like favorite arcs like do you feel like you're ready to rank it now i do i i'm gonna wait until it finishes to have a solidified ranking but i can tell you for sure it's in my top three Same. um i've this weekly experience has been unrivaled man yeah like every chapter um, continues to blow me away the fact that we came here thinking it was gonna be a zoe-esque arc uh I never would have, and Zoe is a phenomenal arc, but I wasn't expecting, like, that's a transition arc. I wasn't expecting what we got here. Mm -hmm. Like, the arc could have ended before we went around the world, and I still would have said, this is one of my favorites because of all of the cool locale stuff and the mysteries and um, Luffy versus Luchi and the Gear 5 explanation. Vegapunk is here. Like, all that stuff was really cool. But once we went around the world, sort of changed the game for me where i didn't think this was possible in a one piece arc for us to leave for a ch 10 chapters mm -hmm. and get shanks greatness garp greatness garp and kuzan greatness uh blackbeard uh the buggy uh, awesomeness then we get the crazy revolutionary army and emu and um and king cobra and all that stuff it's like i can't believe that all happened in this arc and yeah. then we go back to egghead the mystery still continue the Straw Hats go off against Kizaru, and 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 then Garcia Saturn pulls up, mm -hmm. and then we get the Kuma flashback, and then the, all of the Gordo say, like, bro, I gotta say this one <laughs> more time for people yeah. who are out there. Every single member of the Gorosei is on Egghead right now. And not only are they here, they are fighting, and they have transformed. Like, if you would have told me that when I first joined the community, I would have been like, yo... I believe it, but that's got to be like laugh tale stuff. Nah, bro. <laughs> yep. This is happening on Egghead. 
And it's like they themselves are one of the biggest mysteries in the series because they, uh, um, uh, uh, Mercury has Conqueror's Hockey. Um, these individuals have like these Devil Fruit S designs, but none of them have been named yet. Uh, they 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 feel like they themselves are 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 devils. It's like what is going it's on? It's crazy. And, and, and they're doing things that we haven't seen in the series yet. It reminds me of when we first discovered Conqueror's Hockey before before we knew it was called that, mm -hmm. right? Like when Luffy first used Conqueror's Hockey in the Duval arc. And we were like, wait a minute. What is that? Like, what are they cooking there? Then Rayleigh uses it in Sabaody. And we're like, hold up. What is this new ability? And we first hear its name. And Amazon Lily, we're like, oh, this is hockey. And, and slowly but surely it's being built up. That's what this feels like. We're being introduced to a new ability within the world or a new thing in the world. And, it, and we're slowly getting to what that actually is. And it's so interesting. Mm. So interesting. Yeah, I mean, that was uh, one of the biggest surprises to me. Because I, I don't know if you're in the same boat that I was, but um, when we started Egghead, like, I was ready for this arc to be, like, quick. You know, we go in, mm -hmm, have some too. developments, get out. But we've been here for, for a minute, and it's yeah. only escalating more and more and more. It's, <laughs> it's like, it makes me wonder... If if this is where it's at now, and, and we still haven't even gotten to Vegapunk's announcement yet, like we're we're not even at the speech, right. so like all this is already breaking records of insanity in the story, but now we're going to have potentially an insane, like probably the craziest lore dump in the entire story to cap it all off, the cherry on top, yeah. and it's like wow, how is Oda gonna follow this up with the next island, right? Like it's like That's what it's saying. like how like. There's no way Elbaf, or if if that's where we're going next, is not going to be at the very least on some high level of of hype and insanity. Right. If if this is where we're at with Egghead, right? Because no one even expected yeah. Egghead Island to. If, if you look at people's maps of like where we were going arc to arc, no one ever guessed Vegapunk's Island. Like that wasn't on the table, yeah. and now here we are. Yeah. So, yeah, I got a great point. Yeah, I got to say I it's in my top three too. Now that I think about it, like yeah. It's 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 so special and, and I love what you said in regards to Oda potentially having or probably in his mind or in our, our mind being like, how is he gonna live up to this in the next arc? Like it's already been so crazy. And I think that's so interesting because we probably would have said the same thing after Sabaori. You know, yeah. Sabaori, uh Rayleigh, the Pirate King's right hand man, we have the the supernovas, the strats get separated, uh Luffy Celestial Dragon Punch so many iconic moments and we're like there's no way he can possibly top this and then he brings out impel down and marine ford and we're like oh my god <laughs> it's, how did he do it man yeah so that i, I feel like that's got to be similar to what we got coming up like we have um impel down marine ford level arc next i feel like like elbaf sure. even if elbaf is like a transition arc and we're not there for very long I mean, we weren't in Impel Down for very long either. It was just that Oda managed to establish so much in that like little right. span of time. So I could feel the same thing happening with Elbaf and whatever comes after. Sure. Who knows? So yeah, who knows? <laughs> like, who knows? man, I'm ready for like yeah. a, a sharp left turn. You know? Me too. <laughs> yeah. So it's Oda. You know? Yeah. Like it, because it's Oda, we we really never know where we're headed, even if we have an idea of where we're headed. Yeah. Um, it's it's crazy. I, I have to ask you though, what what are you most excited for now now that Gorose have been uh, revealed here, um, the announcement's about to happen, post Egghead is around the corner. In twenty twenty four, what do you think Oda has like in his pocket mm. that maybe he's preparing himself for right now in this three week break? Uh, what what do you think is around the corner, and what are you most excited for that you think is on the way? That's a great question. I was actually going to ask you something similar, so that's perfect. Because okay, I, cool. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I have high hopes for Rouge in particular. Mm -hmm. um, because to me, the way it feels like, the way he's written all the supernova, at least with the Kuma connection, Bonnie would have been perfect to cap off the supernova. As like, this is like one of the most important ones. This is... A character with deep connections to Kuma, Vegapunk, like all the developments that have happened with Bonnie have been earth shattering. But then at the back of my mind, I'm like, but we still have one more. We have one more that we have we haven't gotten anything on. And we've right. seen Arouge here and there. You know, he was watching Kaido. 
uh, jump from the cloud or whatever. And it's like, why? And, he, you know, he's mentioned as he stopped by Whole Cake and he defeated Snack. Um, and it's like, what's the deal with this guy? Like, what? why has Oda not given us more of him up until now? Like, what is he saving him for? That's the thing that's always on my mind with the Ruse. Like, what is he being saved for? Uh, and I've talked about this in one of my videos. Like, I was analyzing his ship and how... Because, you know, a, a lot of pirates can be... You can read a lot about a pirate from looking at their ship. Uh, for example, Bellamy. When we first meet Bellamy, we look at his ship. And at the time, we don't really know much about Doflamingo. So we're not able to piece it together when we first see it. But if you go back in the story and take a look at his ship, it's very obvious that he really looks up to Doflamingo. That he's like Dofi's bardo. You know, because you look at his ship, it has the Dofi... Uh, Jolly Roger as the figurehead. It's it's colored pink. Uh, it's called um, yeah. New Witch's Tongue, and it starts with the same first syllable as Dofi's ship, the Numancia Flamingo. So they, they you oh, know, so it's like it, now that we have yeah. all this knowledge, we can go back and be like, oh, he was a Dofi fanboy. Like that 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 makes sense. Uh, he dressed like him. He looked like him. The pink sh the pink uh, tank top and the you know mm -hmm. the the tongue out the mouth. So we look at Arusha. It's like what's going on with his ship. And um, on the front of his ship, the figurehead is a Hanya. And the Hanya in um, Eastern mythology and Japanese, you know, uh, mythology is that it's a woman who has been converted into a demon due to either jealousy or, you know, desire for revenge or hatred. And it's like, okay, so you have this monk, this guy's a monk, and he, he prays and he has these prayer beads and all this stuff. But his figurehead is a demon. It's a monster. And it's a monster that was, it was someone that was transformed into a monster due to hatred or, or a desire for revenge. So what, what does that symbolize about Arouge? Why, a few questions come to mind. Why is he on the blue sea right now? Like, why isn't he up there in the sky? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, why is he a, a pirate? uh but also a monk why is he a monk but all also displaying a demon like he's holy but displays a demon so the thought that goes through my head and i'm sure a lot of people also came to the same conclusion is that well well it's uh it's probable that aruj came from burka the same city that anel destroyed before he got to skypea and because his homeland is destroyed he would have had to leave he would have had to have been cast out and as a survivor he's now forced down to the blue sea um mm -hmm. So there's the question of like, how does Anel come back into the story? Because people have been looking for a way for him to to tie into the narrative again somehow. And I think it's going to happen with Arouge. And I think that not only is it going to tie into Anel, but it's also going to tie into what Anel's doing on the moon right now. So if we're going to learn about the moon and what's going on on the moon, it's probably going to be around the same time we figure out Arouge's story. So I feel like that's what Oda's kind of working up to with him, like like that cover story with the robots on the moon and stuff like mm -hmm. that. If he's going to bring it in anywhere, it's going to be through this character. And I feel like because Anel is a, a and, and everything with Skype is a microcosm for the world at large. Now that we're actually getting to the point where Emu is going to drop the ball, uh, the, the mm -hmm. you know, the lightning on the world. It's, it's probably mm -hmm. a good time to wrap back into Anel's narrative and his story and kind of like tie it all together with a bow. So I'm really looking forward yes. to that. Uh, Elbaf, I mean, he has... Oda, Oda has a lot of little bits of lore that are given to us through Elbaf or, or the people from Elbaf. Like, I've always harped on this one line at the end of Little Garden. Dorian Bragi said, this is, you know, the attack... This is the spear of, of we mighty giants of Elbaf. Um... The only thing that we can't cut with this is the the great serpent covered in blood. That's what they that was the wording they used. The great bloody serpent. Well, what's the great bloody yeah. serpent? It's the red line, right? Because right. in Norse mythology, you have the Jormungandr, and it's a snake that wraps around the entire world and bites its own tail. Big point. And it's like, okay, well then, what what would they consider to be a giant world serpent? Well, it's the red line. And what could that imply? Because in Norse mythology, if I'm not mistaken, it's said that. Ragnarok, which is like the end of the world, happens mm -hmm. when the serpent lets go of its tail. So, mm -hmm. and and what Ragnarok is, it's the coming of a new age. It's the end of the age of gods and the beginning of the age of man. So, if the world is going to come to an end, if, let's say, the red line were broken in some way, or the you know there was something that maybe the ancient kingdom wanted to destroy the the red line it could be what the ancient weapons are even maybe their intention with the ancient weapons was not to destroy countries with people in it but but to destroy this massive wall 
Um, mm. And now we have the gods of the world living on top of it. So it's like, right. if, you know, we can get a lot of, we can make a lot of uh, assumptions based on this one little mm-hmm. line of, of dialogue that's like, okay, maybe Definitely. One Piece is Ragnarok. The end of their age of gods is going to be related to the destruction of the red line or something like that. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think we're going to get more of that in Elbaf. I'm expecting a lot more of like lore of the One Piece world, but coded in like a, a Elbaf way. Like it's not going to just straight up say, this is the red line. They're going to have a name for it. For they're sure. going to have like some, yeah. you know, these are the yeah. ancient weapons. No, they're not going to call them the ancient weapons. They're going to have another name for it. So I feel like I, that's what Oda's going to be doing this year is he's going to be giving us like sure. really big pieces of info through Elbaf's version of history. So that's that's I love that. yeah. So those two things like Rouge and Elbaf are my big big. I'm I'm expecting a lot this year. What about you, dude? So just to comment on that, as a big NL fan, I would be here no matter what. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's yeah. extremely exciting. Um, and I really like what you said because I've been thinking for, and and seeking out potential uh, Nika references and things within the series. And I'll never forget in the Nolik Kogara flashback, they refer to the snake as a sun god, uh, if I'm not mistaken, within within that thing. And so going back to what you were talking about earlier, that's very fascinating considering the Jormungandr thing and going around the world and, and potentially destroying that, which we know leads into a lot of chaos at the, at the end of the story, which is, you know, one of the big theories that's out mm-hmm. there. So that's that's very fascinating. I'm gonna keep that in mind because that's yeah. that's some um, that's some good stuff. But I also love the idea of like the giants themselves creating their own verbiage and things yeah. for the ancient weapons and stuff. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but for me, the character moments for Luffy, Usopp, and Robin that I believe are incoming. Now we we all see the same thing for uh, characters heading into. Uh, Egghead, for example, right? Like Frankie, even though Frankie's had some awesome moments, the man went to Kizaru and Garcia Saturn was like, F these guys. You know? yeah. <laughs> it was really... So that was that was really good. But uh, we were expecting more of like a Frankie Vegas one connection, which I still believe we, we're going to get some sort of thing of that. But I do believe based on the Dorian Brogy stuff um, that we've been getting lately, and especially with the emphasis on Saul and Oda putting that little thing in his message on reminder on all the different characters and their relationship, relationships with each other. I do believe when we get there, we're going to get insanely just beautiful, I don't know whether they're going to be emotional or epic or hype, maybe all the above moments for those three characters, specifically for Luffy, Usopp, and Robin. That's going to be really exciting considering these are characters that are obviously uh, really important characters to the overall narrative, but just to me and remembering how I got started, my love for the story, similar to you, uh, when I really, really dug deep into it was Water 70's Lobby. And so to have potential, not character conclusions, but near character conclusions happening for Robin and Usopp in this mm-hmm. arc, where Usopp gets the closest he's ever been to being a brave warrior of the sea, with the island of individuals who respect him for who he actually is, is going to be one of the coolest things ever, especially if there's some sort of Loki versus Thor thing going on there. And Usopp ends up being the one, Usopp and Luffy end up being the ones who maybe bring them together, whatever the case may be. I think it's just going to be really cool uh, to see how Oda odifies that classic uh, uh, story and stuff. And with Robin, with the Void Century stuff, it's automatically going to be very, very important specifically with her and Saul, I feel like Oda has something cooking in the in the kitchen there. Um and with with those with those three characters and obviously I think everybody else is gonna shine as well, but those three in particular, I'm looking forward to their character moments within that arc. Now in post egghead, I'm gonna tell you right now, bro, I think the reason why Dragon has not moved is because as he said in the series, he's waiting for the Holy Knights to move and to to be mobilized and i do believe once the godose come back and report what happened here on egghead emu is going to get up from that chair we might even get a face reveal because it, it, it might be about that time Ooh, okay but i do believe emu is going to mobilize the holy knights and if emu mobilizes the holy knights in post egghead then that means the revs are going to move and whether we see that in post egghead or not where they clash is an entirely different story but if they clash at the end of elbaf that to me is going to be the actual ignition of like, oh my god, 
it's it's it, we're on like the the final stretch of the series because once awesome. the revolutionary army and the holy knights clash then we can expect okay blackbeard versus shanks is probably next um zoro and mihawk can't be too far off either laugh tales right right around the corner uh buggy and cross guild shenanigans is probably somewhere around here too like we're very very near the end game of the story and so before all that happens I feel like it's going to give us that one final bit of that one final carrot on the stick in a post arc where he's like, "This is what you can look forward to after this arc: a uh, uh, Holy Knights versus the the Revs, I love or that. Shanks versus Blackbeard." And then when we finish Elbaf, we see either the conclude. Well, I I think he's going to do both of those on screen, um, uh, however long they end up being. But I do think the setup for that happens post Egghead, and it's going to be. Oh, I can't wait, bro! I can't wait. I haven't heard the idea that the that the Holy Knights get mobilized. I like that a lot, actually, because in my mind, I was just jumping to Emu going like, "All right, just like destroy all of it," like you know, like mm -hmm. going totally crazy, um, destroying islands left and right. But I could see, yeah, maybe an in between step before we just get to this, you know, wiping the slate clean. Yeah, maybe mobilize sure. the Holy Knights, have them start to take care of things. So I, I love that idea, actually. I think that'd be really cool. And that would definitely make up for the lack of action on Dragon's part up until now. Right. If it was like, right. if it was purposeful to set up for this, you know, conflict where we have, mm -hmm. you know, the war basically starts with the Revs versus the Holy Knights and then it encompasses the rest of, you know, the people who join both exactly. sides. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. I, I hope you're right about that, actually. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I think I think there's a reason why we never saw the end of the conversation in 1064 with Vegapunk and Dragon. Because it's so weird to me that Vegapunk tells Dragon, Dragon, I think I'm about to die. Like, mm. Shaka legitimately tells him that and then Dragon does not move. Even with Kuma being on the move, it almost felt like Vegapunk at the end of it was like, I'm going to reveal something crazy to the world, and I can't have you here for that. I need you here when they potentially mobilize the Holy Knights, which is probably why Dragon specifically states in the coming chapters after, like, we can't move yet. We've got to wait to move, or we have to wait to make our move when they mobilize the Holy Knights. It almost feels like a direct connection is there between that and the makeup on conversation, but I guess that remains to be seen. Uh, but it's very strange it's a very old thing to do to not give us the end of that conversation and have it connect to something later do so you we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes do you have any hopes regarding like how the story is going to wrap up like in terms of the one piece and how that ties into like the final war that we think is going to happen like <clears throat> i guess my question is a mix of what do you think the events are like the order of events is going to be and what would you what are you hoping is going to be the, not what the One Piece is, but what the culmination of this whole adventure? Like, what do you think it's going to, what was it going to result in? What do you, what do you hope for? Like the final, the finale of the story. You know, what are, what are your hopes there? So I do think Luffy's dream is being set up to be final volume stuff. Um, I think that's like the actual end game. Like. When we find out what that is, uh, is probably our biggest indication. I think we find that out when Oda sends out the message to Shonen Jump, like like he did for, like uh, Kishimoto did for Naruto, like Kubo did for Luigi, like, yo, I got five chapters left in me. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead and send out the message. I got five chapters left. I think that's how close the dream will be to the end of the series. So I say that with, with I say everything I'm about to say with that frame of mind. I think the dream is going to be there at the end, which is probably going to encapsulate the overall message and theme of One Piece. Um, but on onto the One Piece stuff and Laugh Tale and all that, I've been thinking about it so much because I don't know who Oda wants to be there when Luffy finds the One Piece. Obviously, mm. it's going to be a really important moment. I don't know if he wants it to be Straw Hat exclusive. I don't know if it's Straw Hats and the Alliance. I don't know if he wants it to be one of those moments where it feels like a ginormous party. I don't know if he wants it to feel extremely emotional. But what I can tell you is this. After chapter 967, the Laugh Tale Roger reveal chapter where he laughs at, at what Joy Boy said. Ever since then, I've been thinking about a potential recreation of that moment with the Straw Hats. And it being sort of in reverse, whether the Straw Hats are crying listening to this with egghead context. Or they're laughing too, out of respect, similar to maybe what Roger did as well. Where the story is so tragic they have no choice but to laugh just to respect the individuals in the past. So, like, 
maybe like maybe the way that the voice entry is 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 framed is sort of like this hilarious tale where in the back is like the most tragic story in the series. So I don't know how they're going to go uh, about that, but I'm curious in the reaction specifically because of Rayleigh's um, discussion to them or uh, uh, bringing that question up to them and being like, I hope you come up with a different answer than, than, than we do. And maybe that is because of the journey leading, leading them to a different answer. Maybe that's just the characters themselves. And maybe it is at that moment. What are you going to do with the information once you know what actually happened in the Void Sentry? Are you going to laugh like Roger did? Are you going to cry? Like, I'm I'm so curious how that goes. And re regardless of how, however it ends up going, I think that is going to be the Luffy puts his foot down and be like, all right, bro. Now it's, it's time. It's because time. It's, it's, uh, it feels like, for me at least, once, so in my, my mind, I have it like this. Uh, post Egghead, final carrot on the stick, Elbaf, our final quote unquote adventure on an island that's a full blown Dressrosa Alabasta type of arc that's structured in that type of way. Then we go into whatever's next, transition arc, whatever the case may be, a load star, whatever it is. And once we get to Laugh Tale, we'll probably have like most of the pirates there or whatever stuff is happening around the world um, that'll almost bring everybody into the final uh, war, which is what Revolutionary Army starting over there with the Holy Knights and all that stuff. Once they leave there and Luffy and his crew make it, make their decision, that's when I think what Whitebeard said happens. The world gets turned upside down. The ancient weapons go bananas. Red Line gets bursted and, and the all blue and all the characters start finding their dreams and all that stuff. So um, maybe that happens before that. But my thought process is I feel like Odo wants to give focus to that Laugh Tale arc, however long it ends up being. He wants to have the Void Sentry and the One Piece being the focus before the end of War Insanity happens. I think that's what he wants. And if that's what he wants, then once they find the One Piece and the decision is made by the Strat crew, then, like I said, everything is turned on its head. We have the greatest arc of all time, and then we finish <laughs> off with the true meaning of the series, which is either going to be a connection between what the One Piece is and Luffy's dream... Or Luffy's dream is the actual story and message that Oda wanted to tell along the way. Uh, because I feel like it's starting the final saga with Luffy's dream and Shanks saying he wants to go after the One Piece, which are two characters to represent the series so well. Uh, I feel like is is Oda letting us know that when we figure out the, what, what the One Piece is and we figure out what Luffy's dream is, that thing in the middle that connects the two is the actual meaning, mm. like the actual theme of the story. So, um... The way I see it all wrapping up at the end, and it's gonna hit me so hard, is when they make that final journey around the world similar to what Roger did, uh, Luffy probably ends up leaving them off in order of which he got them in reverse. Oh, so, like he'll leave, he, he, okay. he'll leave this character off over here, this this character, this character, until the last one is Zoro, and he says goodbye to Zoro, then he goes oh. off by himself to whatever it is. But it's gonna be the most emotional chapter in the series. I oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. Bro. It's it's gonna hit so hard, man. Oh, like, oh, that's great. That that would be it. so yeah. if it's him and Zoro, like the last two people on the ship at the oh, yeah. that would <laughs> that would yeah. make me cry like legit. That would, be, that would kill I mean, me. Hard, bro. It'd make me uh, cry so hard, dude. I, I wanna bounce off of what you said, uh, but before I do, I just wanna ask because we are at an hour twenty, I wanna ask, are you are you good on time? Like I feel like the discussion's going great if we can just keep cooking, but like if you have anything, sure. just let me know. You know, there's no pressure on how long you have to be on stream. Um and we also got some questions, some good questions in the chat that I want to get to after this. But let me first bounce off. So I like what you said about the crying, uh, laughing thing, the the dynamic there when they see the one piece, because when the when it was first revealed, like Roger laughed. Everyone, I guess the assumption, the default assumption was whatever the one piece is has to be something funny or something that would make Roger laugh. And I, I agreed at first, like I thought that at first, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it doesn't necessarily have to be the case because two things. One, we get that scene through Odin, who is to some degree an unreliable narrator because in his journal, he talks about how when the Roger pirates parted ways not a single tear was shed. But then we see in the panel, everyone was crying. So the journal says one thing, but the reality was another. They get to the one piece, Roger laughed, but could it be, the, you know, 
is the laughter like tears of tears of joy is it like crying laughter like what's the deal there and the reason i i suspect that it could be a tragic thing and they're laughing at at the tragedy of it is tying back to ohara water seven when robin meets saul and saul teaches robin how to laugh and the whole idea is like robin's sad and saul's like well if you're ever feeling sad just laugh and you'll feel better and he teaches a, a d clan member teaches robin hey whenever you're feeling sad just laugh laugh through it and when robin is sailing away from the burning island what is she doing on the boat she's laughing or she's trying to laugh so the way i see it is like they get to the final island they see the one piece it's such a tragic history a tragic story whatever it is it has got to be you know devastating and it's so devastating that Roger being the happy go lucky kind of guy he is the D clan member that he is you know smiling in the face of death that's what all the D clan members do with with all this horrible tragedy in front of him his decision is to laugh and he has you know he's laughing so hard that tears sprang to his eyes well was it because the, were the tears springing to his eyes because of the laughter like which came first was he crying and then laughing like that's what i'm saying that the order of events might have not been as odin depicted it and i could see that being the case where the one piece is not something funny in fact it's the opposite it's something totally not funny but the the, the people the the reaction that they had looking at it was you know there we have to we have to kind of smile through it smile through the adverse adversity laugh through the adversity right and maybe that's what where what you said comes in where luffy puts his foot down and it's like no no no, no. i'm not laughing at this yeah. i'm not crying yeah. i'm not gonna laugh we're gonna do something about this that's the, he's gonna come to the different conclusion and he's not gonna laugh right. um so yeah i think i think you're on the money there and i'm, I'm with you 100 percent of the way that I, I do think that, yeah, there's going to be something tragic about the One Piece, and that's what's going to, that's what elicited that reaction from Roger. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I like that a lot. I hope that, you know, you're right about that final sequence of the story with dropping everyone off at the islands. Oh, I man. Yeah. Uh, That would be beautiful, very, like, full circle. I mean, that's how Oda's been mm -hmm. doing it with the whole story. Their, in, their adventure sure. is literally going in a full circle, you know, going around the yeah. world. So it, it would be poetic. Um, in a way uh, let me ask you a question from the chat I saw a few good ones so we'll actually do a couple okay. um, we got a question from Mr. Rubik's 01 and the question is if you had control over the One Piece remake Wit is doing are there any changes to story or structure you would make or would you want the story to be exactly like the manga with updated animation see it's difficult for me to answer this because I love the changes Toei has made to quite a few scenes. I'll give you an example, right? The walk to Arlong Park is not in the manga. I can't imagine One Piece without that scene. So it's like, it's difficult for me to want a one-to-one -one with the manga because then I wouldn't get like the walk to Arlong Park. I wouldn't get uh, certain like episode 1015, my favorite episode in the series. Half of it is anime only, right? So like I okay. I like the anime only stuff when it hits or that the toy is, is done. Uh, but if I was in control... I think one arc that I would, I would personally want to extend a little bit would actually be um, something like a, a a drum island, a little garden, or a whiskey peak uh, mm. early on. That sh that sort of gives uh, s uh, some sort of indication of what they're gonna do, adding in scenes if that's what they do. So, like for example, in Whiskey Peak, we could get some really cool uh, additional sequence with uh, Zoro whenever he's fighting the 100 bounty hunters where we see, because uh, in the manga and in the anime, we see like the aftermath of it. Uh, the remake will give us the opportunity to see how it was when he was actually fighting quite a few of them. Um, that's an opportunity there or, or something like that. Uh, if it, it just depends on what they, what kind of vibe they're going to go for, because if they want a one-to-one -one remake of the manga, they can most certainly do that. And I think the magic of the anime is in those little, additional sequences and if i were in control i would want more of that just not you know padded out to oblivion but like the really sure. good ones that stick with us as fans like the walk to Arlong park 
like episode 1015, like a bunch of the anime only editions they did in Wano that really fleshed out a mm-hmm. lot of the characters and other situations and made it feel impactful. Uh, so more stuff like that. If I were in control, I would let the directors cook because they've cooked a lot yeah. uh, in the series for sure. I think the live action is kind of a testament to that too, because regardless of what you think about the live action, you know, I, I know some people out there didn't love it. Um, some people really mm-hmm. did, but I think there are some moments that they added in that were not in the manga that I thought were great character moments. Like Baratier comes to mind specifically uh, Zoro and Nami at the bar, like yeah. before the Mihawk challenge and like having that conversation, right. developing that friendship. I think that was like, honestly, the, the show would be much worse without moments like that. If they took, if they mm-hmm. tr- just tried to do it one-to-one with the manga, um, I actually think the show would have been a little bit worse off. I think those little moments added so much to the characters. Uh, Nami and and Luffy and Zoro in the changing room in Kaya's house, like trying on the outfits. Like there, there's yes. little things like that, those little character moments and details that I think just add so much flavor and personality sure. to early One Piece. And I think of all the parts of One Piece that need that extra flavor, it's early One Piece because... Yeah. That's probably the biggest gateway to getting people into the the full series that mm-hmm. because you know realistically the Studio Wit remake is probably going to be giving exposure to One Piece to people that wouldn't have tried it otherwise because it's like oh a new anime better pacing uh and I want I feel I think the early One Piece struggles the most at at getting people in because you know if you look at the number of chapters before we even get to Arlong Park for example by that point in time in, let's say, Naruto, we're already at the tuning exams. We're getting Rock Lee versus right. Gara. You know, there's stuff right. that's already hooking people. But with One Piece, I feel like you have to invest more to really learn what the story is trying to do, uh, especially once we get into the Grand Line. It takes a while for us to get there. So I feel like spicing up East Blue is a really good thing if they if they wanted like to do that. that. Yeah, I, I feel like it needs a little bit extra. As much as I love early One Piece, I understand that it might Me be too. it might be a little hard for, you know, everyone to just immediately latch on to and be like this is great, you know. Right. So, right. I think a good a good example of that would be Logetown, right? Like yeah. Logetown in the manga was five chapters. The anime may, truly took it in its, into its own and each character got their own little side story yep. episode that fleshed them out. Sanji, Usopp, Zoro, like it, it it really allowed the, the the entire thing to breathe and feel like, oh, this is our goodbye to the East Blue. All the characters have learned so much up until this point that if they would not have gone on the journey with the Straw Hats, they wouldn't have been able to overcome the challenges that they were that they had in Logetown. Um, and so the way the anime handled that with their additional sequences, stuff like that throughout the entirety of the East Blue would be so good. Yeah. I would love that. Agree. I, I, I totally agree. I loved how they did it in the anime. Even that one episode with, uh, what was it, Daddy Masterson? Like, I yeah, like Daddy that. Daddy the I, Father. Yeah, Daddy, <laughs> Daddy the Father. Like, I like that. I like that a lot. I thought it was a Me great too. great, great little sequence. Um, Me too. You know, kind of a shame that, that Oda had to cut that from the manga, but, you know, it's cool that it made it into the anime. Um, all right, so let's uh, do another question, and then we'll get we'll change up the topic a little bit. Um, got a question from a Reverse. How do you think Usopp will know when he has achieved his dream? I don't think he will, and I think that'll be the magic of the moment. I think it'll be the other characters around him that are Ooh. going to be like, oh, wow. Like, like They're going to be sitting there in shock that Usopp is leading these giants and the Tontadas into into some sort of situation that everyone's like what he's not scared of going to the island or what he's not scared of doing this and and um they're not even going to say it to him they're just going to say it to each other and like oh and then someone maybe to end the chapter whether it's a tontada a giant one of the strats would be like usopp's become a brave warrior of the sea and it it, and it'll give us that type of thing same thing as your reader where usopp was always a brave warrior it just took this entire journey to get it out of him and so when he actually becomes that, it'll be that moment of not self-realization, but the other characters being like, that's what you had in you the whole time. And I think that's what Oda's going to be going for. Eventually, he'll be like, oh, did I really do that? <laughs> oh, I guess I am the brave warrior or something, right? Like, I could see that. Um, but I do think it's going to be coming from another character for sure. Ever he really, truly does um, achieve his dream. I, I agree because it's like the whole story Usopp is talking himself up. He's always saying like, I'm this, right. I'm that, I'm this and that. And it's like, 
the way for him to truly become what he says he wants to be is not for him to be the one to say it, but for someone else to say it, you know, because that's where it really comes from. It's the recognition that he gets from the people around him. It's not just, I'm declaring myself a brave warrior of the sea. So I, I agree with that totally. Um, yeah, I think that, I think that's probably what's going to happen. I, I still, I'm still hanging on to the theory that I had, which was Usopp's going to get a book written about him the same way Nolan had a book. Mm. Um, I think I might've shared this. It might've been on your reverie actually, uh, which I want to ask you about in a bit, but, um, (laughs) uh, yeah, I think the, the, what, what's going to have to happen in my opinion is that Usopp is the inversion of Mont Blanc Noland where, you know, the Tontata worshiped Noland. And then Usopp said he was a, he, he lied about being a descendant of him. When they first meet cricket, Usopp accuses him of being a liar, despite Usopp being a liar and cricket was telling the truth. Um, and the book is Nolan the Liar, but Nolan was an honest guy. He was a real, he was a brave warrior of the sea who was depicted as a liar in history. Usopp is, for most of the story, kind of, you know, a liar and, and a coward, a little bit of the opposite of, of Nolan. But by the end of the story, he's going to be recognized as a brave warrior. And how do you do that? You immortalize it through fiction, which is what Usopp's all about. Aesop's fables, right? So like you're going to have Usopp's fables in a way, but they're not going to be known as fables. They're going to be real stories. And how does it come together? Uh, one of Usopp's original crew, his three friends, his childhood friends, one of them was Tama Negi, Onion. And what was his dream? It was to become a writer. So oh, that's the connection. Usopp's like that. gonna come back home with all these real stories to tell, and it's gonna be inspiration for his friend to write a book about Usopp. I think that's gonna have to be. I think that that would be like the moment he gets the book will be the moment he's immortalized as that brave warrior. It's like these are the tales that people are going to tell about him uh in the future and we'll we'll be the only ones as the readers we'll know what he was really like <laughs> the books are going to depict mm-hmm. him a certain way we know what usopp mm-hmm. was like the real usopp mm-hmm. um no so, dude yeah. i love that idea i think that's so that's so lord of the rings um <laughs> of like uh the guy just uh, that's so good i um i i would love that because like you said usopp has not only uh been a character that is trying to immortalize himself through fiction you know he's he's hyping up chopper believes everything he's saying uh, other characters don't kaya still believes right even though in the back she's like i don't know if he's trolling or not but when he comes back with actual this is the journey i've been on they're gonna be like yeah like 100 percent it was yeah. and like you said we as as the reader will be like that's not how he actually was but it's gonna be super cool because that's sort of like what what the entire story has been going for is like the things that you believe in the sort of the, the, the lies and of like the WG and the lies of like Usopp and, and like the certain things that certain characters believe in and their propaganda and stuff. And Usopp's case is coming from a, a genuine part of the heart. Like he wants to be this dude. And when he's actually becomes this dude, it's like, yeah, all this stuff was a fable, but that one truth that, mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that yep. was actually goaded. Yeah. And um and I, I love that. I love that idea a lot. And and it's I, funny cuz like idea. you know it's like Aesop's fables are like they're fables, right? But Usopp lived out some of those fables in his story. Like right. the boy who cried wolf. That was actually that actually happened with Usopp. That's a, that's one of Aesop's fables. Another one was the wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, Us- uh, Kaya had two butlers. And one of them was Clahador, and the other one was a literal sheep man, <laughs> like Mary. Nice. And it's like one of the butlers was wearing the, the sheep's clothing in that respect. Mm-hmm. So, like, yeah, mm-hmm. he's actually living out these things that would be considered fables yeah. in our world. So I, I feel like that's got to be um, some somewhat of what Oda's going for there. So uh, let's pivot off of this, and let's talk a little bit about The Reverie. I wanted to ask you, just mm-hmm. because you were the last host of The Reverie, and I wanted to ask you about your experience, like going into that, you know, how'd you prepare for it? How'd you feel going into it? How do you, you know, um, how do you feel about it overall? Like, just tell me a little bit about your experience with that. Cause I'm curious. And I think it's like a big undertaking and anyone hosting the reverie, it's like a big community event. It brings people together. Sure. Uh, and that's one of the things I really respect you for, because I think that reverie went great. I really like how it all came together. Sure. It was very fun. Uh, I was messing around during that stream with my Zoro Sanji bullshit. <laughs> so, I, you know, like I thought, you know, it was a fun time. I wanted to ask you, get your perspective on it. You know, like, tell me a little bit about that. Dude. Uh, first and foremost, I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for, for the kind words. Um, so going into it was the most nervous I think I've ever been for anything. And like it, it wasn't even nerves in regards to 
is it going to go well? Is it going to be this? It was more of nerves. Like, I can't believe this is actually happening. You know, I've been, I've been in the community watching uh, individuals since like 2010, 2011 with, with King of Lightning, Sawyer 7, Ma Sawyer 7 Mage. Um, and these individuals that I, I always watched on the way home from school for their One Piece stuff. And then I got into the community and I eventually became friends with these dudes. And, and then the reverie concept became a thing uh, when uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Roger that, Roger. that, that did the first one, and um, and we've been doing them ever since. And I was like, man, I like those events are always so special because to me, the most important part about this community, or most more the most important part about the One Piece experience is the community. Like anytime somebody asks me well, why One Piece is my number one, I always tell them it's because the weekly experience is unmatched. Um, the I can find a well written story in any medium, but I can't find what the Drums of Liberation two week break was in any other story. I can't mm -hmm. find what like the week that Gear Four was announced was in any story, and um and that to me is sort of like the encapsulation of what allows the One Piece community to be so special. We all know how toxic it can be. We all know <laughs> how crazy it can be, and and especially during break weeks. But at its core, it's such a special thing, and I owe so much to it. And I felt like the Reverie was my opportunity to give back for all of those years of being a part of this. And because of that, I was like, I want to get all my people in there. And and it's unfortunate that uh, some individuals that really wanted to be there uh, weren't able to make it due to, to scheduling. But everybody who was there, it meant so much to me because not only do I highly respect and appreciate everybody who's there, but it's sort of like a dream even for me as someone who's a, a, a viewer and and at heart first. Where just being the individual who can be in control of the conversations. It's like I was Oda for a second. I, <laughs> or like I'm writing and I'm like, all right, I, I get to give the, the keys to Hidden here and then to Parvision here and, and the King of Lightning here. And it was just, I, it was so cool being able to like live that out and, and be in that position where I could have individuals talking over on the channel about the series love so much with each other where i have the front row seat and it was like it was the coolest thing ever um leading up to it though like i said i reached out to everyone who's ever hosted i reached out to roger brago uh, cole jay randy every single person who has ever hosted i reached out to them and i was like what is your advice i've never hosted anything like this before would you recommend what are some things that uh for like breaks and for uh individuals and 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 um and uh topic time and all sure. that stuff like all the all the things for, for the behind the scenes and i um, mean i'm just so grateful that people like jay and and fiji helped me out with the specifics because i'm i i don't really do live collaborations because i'm still not that good on the technical side of things uh, which is why I do them like pre-recorded, but they were able to help me out where I felt so comfortable that I knew everything was going to go right because they went out of their way to help me out and set that up. And then once uh, we got it started, the entire stream was way better than I could have ever imagined, man. Like it, I remember I had ideas for how things could go, but y'all cooked so hard throughout <laughs> the entire thing. And it was just like, man, this is easy. I, I genuinely felt like it was the easiest job in the world. Once we actually got started Le leading up to it, I was like, man, I, how is it going to go? Like, is, 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 um, I remember my, my power went out at around like 4.30 in the afternoon. Because we were streaming it from Jay's uh, uh, place, it didn't go out. Only I was gone for a little bit. I was like, see, that would have happened, right? Like, That's like all a these wipe things... the sweat off, like, whoo. Right, <laughs> like, right. Holy... Like, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. So um, it was it was one of those things to where uh, everything happened the way that it had to happen. We had a great time. And I appreciate you. Like I said, I reached out to you before the, before the stream started, if I could do a little quiz show and stuff like that, because I really liked it whenever I saw what you guys were doing, as well as um the the bingo card. Yeah. I was like, man, this bingo card idea is yeah. so cool. And so I, I appreciate you for giving of me the course. opportunity to do that. And, of um, course, bro. And, uh, and so because I wanted us to have fun, right? Yeah. The first thing I thought of with the Reverie was, you know, for this one in particular, and I know that I'm sure for some individuals who were expecting us to dive into, you know, Final Saga live action and, and even though we got into a lot of that stuff, 
because it was on my channel, I was like, I just want to have fun, dude. Like, I want to do the quiz shows, and I want to do the, the thing, and the even the crazy straw hat tier discussion. I was like, I want to have everything that makes this community special. From the toxic stuff, to the best stuff, to the wholesome stuff, to the everything. It's everything that makes our community special, and I think... That's how I structured the reverie and what I wanted it to be. So I hope that came across the way that it did. And it, did. it was something that uh, I appreciate you. It's something that, that I'm very proud of. And anytime somebody asks me now uh, for, uh, oh, um, if you're, you're doing YouTube, like what video would you recommend? I'm like, that one. Uh -huh. <laughs> Go out. Even if you've never watched One Piece, I guarantee you will get some sort of entertainment out of that video. So yeah, uh, I, I, uh, I really appreciate entire community for showing support for that it's something i'll never forget and i'll and i'll carry with me forever it, it'll be like in my resume and in the in the thing of like whenever i'm near near death and i'm like man i hosted the biggest community event in, yep. our, in our community like I, I i can hold that in my thing and and i'll always i'll always be grateful for that you so, did and you cooked uh, and I'll, you all love all love to you guys yeah thank man. you man. yeah i, I mean it was it was a uh, really fun to be a part of i really enjoyed it like start to finish you know uh it's it's honestly hard to get me to sit down for eight hours, nine hours to do anything, <laughs> like just in one place. <laughs> so the fact that I was there for that whole time, I mean, it, you know, it's it just I was I was locked in. It was a great time. It was really fun. And I gotta say, I, I also just want to say you picked my favorite, my single favorite color spread for the theme of your of your thumbnail. That is my favorite color spread in all of One Piece. I love the shit out of that image. So, yeah. like, when I saw that yeah. thumbnail, I was like, oh, this is so good. Like, <laughs> you you picked the perfect one. Yeah. Great taste, because when I reached out to the artist, which, uh, shout out to Maj Khan, who did a phenomenal job, uh, I I was like, can you do this? Um, it's, I, I love One Piece color spreads. I feel like we can do this with the community. Would it be possible? And it went until the final day that I got it around two hours before start time, where I was like, you got it, and it's ready to go. And it was so perfect, because like you said, I also love that color spread, and I feel like it just, it captured what we were going for, with the yeah. which is just a fun, exciting, maybe toxic and hilarious oh, stream that was incoming. <laughs> dude, even the, so, even the toxicity is fun, man. As long as people don't take it oh, personally, no, it's, fun. it's fun. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a part of our DNA in the community. It dude, really yeah. is. And, and, and it's, and it can be a lot of fun. So I just, I wanted to tap into that. And I think that should be, honestly, I feel like the color spread getting a, like adopted for like reverie thumbnails. I, I think that's a mm -hmm. standard setting right there. Like, like, that that's a really great idea and I, I hope that future reveries do that too like just pick the coolest color spreads out of one piece and just like you know swap out the the characters for the youtubers that's like brilliant it's like perfect right. so um right. but yeah man I, I i think that's really cool and and i i just gotta say i i appreciate how cool the community is with each other and you know obviously there's always going to be, you know, a little bit of uh, like spats here and there and, and people disagree. And like you said, the, the, the toxicity over like certain like arguments over power scaling or whatever. But ultimately, yeah. I just really appreciate that the community is so welcoming um, that For you sure. were welcoming me onto the reverie. You know, I'm, I'm a new I'm new, I'm a new guy, you know, like so it was it was very cool to be there. Um, and just the fact that like in our daily lives, I'm, I'm not sure how true it is for you, but for me, like, I don't know that many people in my life that I could talk to about one piece at such a high level, mm -hmm. but like just to be in one place where it's like all these people are like basically one piece historians all in one place, just yeah. shooting the shit. Like, you know, just like going back and forth. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a blessing. I'm like very glad to, to yeah. be a part of that in any capacity. So very cool. And I want to yeah, ask, yeah. I, I want to ask you, um, a, f uh, a fun question that might be it's a little bit of a change of topic but since since you mentioned you mentioned sports earlier and that you're in i know you're into sports you're the coach you know like <laughs> tell me coach okay i want to know your this this is something I, I have to ask you you're making a starting five lineup for basketball okay. using one piece characters okay. who are your starting okay. five and what positions do they play i gotta know great question great question so i have kaido at center I have no question about that. I <laughs> need, go. I need, a, I need, I need a shack like presence at center. <laughs> I'm gonna form my whole team around him. There's no question about that. So I'm gonna have him there. Um, I need somebody that can hit the rim from any 
Dive in the lane, uh, hit that space jam shot, you know, where he can stretch. So I got to have Monkey D there. I'm going to have him at shooting guard. I don't want him running the point because I feel like he'd get distracted too much. Mm -hmm. so I'll have him at, at, uh, at shooting guard. I'm going to put Foxy at small forward because I feel like I need him on defense. I need okay. my, my defensive <laughs> okay. lockdown just to hit that slow, slow beam at any given point. Uh, to be able to separate and and create that those those opportunities there uh, for the team to to be successful and stuff of that nature um at power forward i'm gonna go uh, uh, let's see at power forward i'm gonna put blackbeard i feel like it would be a good opportunity for us to have somebody with the quake quake fruit and the yummy yummy no me so i can bring the ball towards him he dishes out the rock to the individual who's by the rim which is hopefully kaido uh, because if we just keep feeding the ball to Kaido, we'll be all right. <laughs> just keep feeding it to Kaido. That's sick. And we'll be okay, right? That needs to be our game plan. And then running the point, the individual with the biggest, highest basketball and in-game IQ is going to be Nami. No oh, question. Okay. And the, and the reason why I say that is Nami, Nami is going to make me money in the stands, selling merchandise, uh, uh, selling tickets. Uh, but not only she's going to be smart in that regard, she's going to be smart in terms of a game plan, a master planner. I would normally put Law in that situation, but Law's plans always fail. Nami's plans succeed. So I was like, I got to put Nami at point guard. She can dish off the rock. She's going to know the highest probability of success, which is to give the ball to Kaido, put his butt <laughs> up against the 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 backboard, and let him get 140 points. And that's where we're going to win every game. That's beautiful. Every I love that. <laughs> I love that. I love I love that you frame one. Frame one, you had Kaido ready to go. You're like, all right, I'm just build I'm building a team around Kaido. We're we're putting him at center. Like that's that's great. That was a great answer. No question. Um, no question. Man, I you know it's funny. I put this question down because I knew you would kill it with this one. I didn't even think my starting five through completely, but I have to agree with a lot of what you said. I feel like I'd put maybe I, I got to get Cat on there somewhere. Like Kata Curry would make like a great, okay. he'd like make that. like a great power forward. I feel like um, I want to put Kobe at point. I I feel Ooh. like he's he's high like IQ. That. He's a high IQ you know player. He would be a high IQ player. He's good about teamwork. I feel like his whole his whole thing is about like you know knowing who he's who he's with, how he can like help them or work together with them. Uh, he's got the observation. Co Kobe is an observation hockey right. genius. The man awakened it on Marine Four, yeah. like out of nowhere. So he's got he he'll have full like knowledge of what's going on on the court at any given time. Um, I feel like Kizaru's really got to cool. be. I didn't even think about observation yeah, hockey. That's yeah, a great point. the observation's got to be a big thing, you know. Uh, Kizaru is just a fast. He's just really fast. He's got amazing sure. amazing reach i mean the man's like a lanky as, as mm -hmm. fuck so like you put kizar anywhere he's accurate i i'd imagine he'd be an accurate shooter um Good point who would i put at who would i did i say shooting guard i who would i put at shooting guard i honestly i was thinking luffy all like luffy would just be great on the court i feel like with those he'd powers just be great dude just be... just just literally take it stretch and put it in, <laughs> put it in do, bro. Like, do you it. think he'd be a ball hog though do you do you Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, which is why I didn't make him a point guard. <laughs> That's why I didn't make him a point guard. Because, bro, he's either going to get distracted by someone else in the other team, someone in the stands, or go straight for the rock. Unless I tell him, like, yo, Luffy, if we win this game, that's why I put Nami a point. Nami's going to know <laughs> she's going to smack Luffy in the back of the head until he gets it right. Uh -huh. Or she's going to be like, yo, Luffy, if we win, we're treating you out to a bunch of meat. <laughs> all right, we're treating you out to a bunch of a steak dinner or something, yeah. right? Like then Luffy would be like, "All right, let's go feed the rock to Kaido. Let's go." <laughs> or something. I love that. So. I love that, bro. Um, all right, well, cool. Uh, let me see if we got any final questions in the chat, and then oh, actually, you know what? I do have one more question for you myself before we maybe turn it to the chat and then we close things out for today. Uh, we were talking about video games earlier. I want to ask you. Let's tie it into One Piece. What would your ideal One Piece video game look like? If you could have, if you could, if you had the Dragon Balls in front of you, you could make a wish for a One Piece video game. What, what exactly would your wish look like? What are you looking for? I was saving this for, I'm hoping to do a Final Fantasy VII Rebirth spoiler cast uh, here in a couple weeks. And this is going to be my opening line. Uh, so I, I might just have to repeat it there. But I genuinely sure. feel like if you substitute the Final Fantasy VII cast and put in the One Piece cast, that is my dream One Piece game. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth 
feels like such a magical adventure with the characters and tra traversing each town genuinely makes it feel like if they were to make a One Piece game that's just like this, it would be sensational. It, it would be like... Like I said, I think that's why Rebirth genuinely might be my favorite game ever because it takes everything I love from One Piece with little character moments and all that stuff. Uh, the side quests that feel so important to each individual character, the interactions mattering, everything that's based around in the game is for the characters and about the characters, to the themes, to everything. Literally everything. And that's what I would want in my One Piece game to make it shine on top of godly and phenomenal combat. Now, if it wouldn't be a single-player JRPG... Uh, which is that's my bread and butter so that's what i would want to go for and that's why i really enjoy one piece odyssey but i feel like ff7 rebirth just hits uh -huh. that great middle ground of action and, and turn based and so i think that would be my perfect one piece game however i could see another world where the dream one piece game the actual greatest one piece game is a wow yep final fantasy 14 type of you get to create your character whatever you want to make them as and then they join a faction Join the Revs, join the Marines, become a pirate, and you set sail and or start from from uh, <coughs> Kobe as uh, scrubbing the decks or starting under Dragon as a member of the Revolutionary Army, whatever it is. And you work your way up and you can choose to be proficient in hockey. You could even choose to eat a devil fruit and maybe that's random too. Like uh -huh. you don't know what fruit you're going to end up getting. Um, you could even choose a teacher, like how Luffy had Rayleigh. Maybe you go out and you choose, I don't know, Sabo, and he teaches you how to use his techniques or whatever the case may be. And then because it's an MMO, of course, there's opportunities for PvP, there's opportunities for raids on these massive large-scale battles that One Piece yep. is really good at. Um, but that, to me, I think would be the dream large-scale One Piece game, is one that has all those different factions, all of these different abilities, and... Uh, a balanced system with like hockey and fruits and fishman karate and and all that stuff and then you get to choose what it is you want do you want to become a, a swordsman like a zoro or do you want to go full-blown hockey like a reindeer <coughs> or something like what what would be your type of uh move set and you would have to establish that right off the bat or as you go down the line, you can really think about it. Okay, if my fruit does this, depending on the fruit that I get, I could be more proficient in hockey, or maybe I would like to put those points into fishman karate, or whatever the case may be. There's a lot of opportunities for creativity, but yeah. um, an MMO One Piece game, I can't believe it doesn't exist. I feel like that's the biggest, easiest, not only cash grab, but also just layup. You can't yeah, fail at that. bro. You cannot fail it's... at a One Piece MMO, dude that's my answer too it's like, it's got to be the mmo because yeah. think about it in mmos you have guilds so imagine just a guild is a pirate crew like you you can join someone's crew and it's like okay the lower level players yeah i'm sure everyone's gonna like want to make their own crew but eventually you know you go out there in the world you end up getting attacked by one of the higher level crews and you're like shit i like i can't do this all, you know as a low level crew maybe i gotta join one of the yonko of, of this game you know like you gotta join a crew i hope the devil fruits would be random i, I would be fine with there being duplicates uh and then they explain it away as saying like oh vegapunk cracked the code and was able to clone devil fruits so there's duplicates everywhere right um, but then like, right. you like eat a devil fruit and it's like, that's the one for your character. Like you, you don't know what you're going to get. Right. You're just stuck with it. And uh, I think that would yeah. be so, that would be so cool. I don't know about how, how it would work balance wise, but, uh, it would be, I, I would have no life if that game came out. I would oh, be doing, insane. I would be doing, I'd be like Asmon gold, like sitting there playing like one Yo, piece of nonstop, nonstop, man. Legit. Um, I would hope there's legit. some way there, to there like, would be nothing but that game on our channels oh yeah dude <laughs> it would be so free and and like you said it's a layup and like why haven't they done it yet i feel like for me my my there, there's always this question that comes up it's like why does one piece not really have any good video games maybe that you know you, you enjoy pirate warriors or something like that but there's nothing that's come out of one piece video game wise that's like really good good uh and it's like why hasn't that happened why don't they make more one piece video games more often my answer has always been they're waiting for it to end before because mm. like with dragon ball dragon ball gets a ton of games but most of the games are just retreading the the z storyline i feel like and the reason for that is yeah. because dragon ball for a long time was done it was finished and 
they needed a way to get more money from the IP, from the franchise. And when One Piece is over, we have the full picture. We know the full scope of the story, what the One Piece is, where everything's supposed to like go. Um, I feel like when it, when it's over, they're going to need a way to make money from One Piece that isn't relying on Oda making new chapters. Because Oda's not, probably not going to want to continue writing more spinoffs and stuff like that. It's going to be done. Not at all. Yeah. So how do they make more money off of it? Well, easiest way in the world is make video games for it. Uh, so right. I think once the once the series is over, everything's like in, in its final resting place, um, that'll be the time for them to make the One Piece fighting game. That'll be the time for them to make the MMO. That'll be the time for them to do all of that. And I, I hope they do all of that. I, I would like a One Piece RPG, like you said. I would like a One Piece MMO. I, I think they could do all of these things. It's just going to – we need the series to, to end before we get into that territory. So, you know, that's something uh, – it's, it's funny because, like, obviously we don't want One Piece to end. We, we're, we're – you know, we're, we love the story. I'm not looking forward to the day that I read the last chapter. Oh, me neither. And, and, yeah, and have to set it down, you know. But yeah. there's a little bit of a silver lining there where it's like, okay, after One Piece is over – what's next for the, the, the franchise right. video games, maybe more movies like non-canon films, um, you know, spin-off novels. All of YouTube is probably going to go all in onto the analysis end of it because now then we'll have the full story to analyze. So it's like, there's, there's a lot of good stuff that's going to come out of the end of the series that I think we can look forward to. Um, and I mean, as as you know, people that talk about this every day, I hope so because you know it'll yeah. give us it'll give us more to talk about. It's like I live off the you know, right. like I I I, I wake up every day looking forward to the new One Piece thing. Like I'm just always you know, so yeah, yeah I'm with you there. It's it's a uh, it's crazy because like I said before, I've experienced this where the uh, a story that I really love ends that's long, right? Like I was there when Naruto ended and it destroyed me. I was there when <laughs> yeah. Bleach ended. And it destroyed me, uh, like uh, Kintama ended and destroyed me. But I've none of them. I was invested to this level, right? Like when One Piece ends, I've been invested in the series, and especially at that time for a really long time. And it's not even just the story itself; it's the connections we've made, like the podcast we're doing right now, where I've connected with so many people thanks to this story. That when it ends, it's like. All of that's going to be circling back in my mind. The memories with the series and with the people that I've met thanks to the series. And it's like, oh, oh yeah. I'm not looking forward to that day at all. Like like you said, there's there's a silver lining for sure. But it's like, man, yeah. I'm going to be in pain. It's going to be <laughs> the, the last the last reverie that we have, like when like to, to cap off the series, like the final reverie. That's going to be. Yeah. That's gonna be special. That's gonna be a very special one. I yeah. hope that's a twenty-four hour stream. I hope that's like a, like a full day of just like honoring One Piece. For sure. Um, For sure. Oh, that's gonna be a good. I time. would love to have it in real life, honestly. Like where all of us Ooh, are able to get together. That... I wanted to, that. That would be really, really special. Just as our final reverie, we all get together around an actual reverie yeah. table and have that discussion. That'd that would be so cool. That would have to be the time to do it. Like if we're ever gonna organize like a, a full everyone comes in person for like a like a reverie oh that would be that would be awesome just like a full day of yeah. just like non-stop yeah that would that'd be sick um but yeah man let me uh let me just see if there's any questions in the chat that i missed and then after that we'll yeah. uh we'll wrap things up for today um let's see okay let me just do a little bit of scrolling here hmm mm hmm I see a lot of troll questions, like asking, "Have you heard about has has he heard about the bald island theory?" They're just making fun. Guys, put the emojis in the chat so so he knows what the bald thing is. Because I I had this picture when I shaved my head, and and ever since then it okay. became like an emote that everyone's been spamming. I, I think it's pretty funny. But uh, we get ready it's, for it's a wall. Bald yeah, it's called bald island or bald hidden. You've been dropping these. You'll see it in the chat. Oh, I see. It's gonna I be a it. wall. <laughs> it's gonna be a wall of those now. I put that on the thumbnail too for the for the hype. Yeah, here we go. Um, Bald Island. <laughs> I see a, a question from Shakti Marenge saying, opinions on the real-life Marine Ford happening because of the Dragon Ball theme park. So there's a there's a Dragon Ball mm. theme park. I'm not oh. sure if that's the um, 
that's the question. But do you you think there's potential for a one piece theme park? Because I would love that. If if it continues where it's going, because right now, uh, so I went to a convention a couple of weeks ago, and I saw. Now let me put it to you like this, right? Are you, are you a Star Wars guy? Yeah. Okay, so bro, Hayden Christensen and Ewan mm-hmm. McGregor were here, uh, in, at the convention. That was the biggest draw, obviously. Yeah. Everyone was really excited for that. So, but to from what I saw with my own eyes, I felt like the One Piece hype there was just as high as the Star Wars hype. And there was so many Star Wars fans. So that really opened my eyes. Like, there's a lot of One Piece fans. And I know I live in an area where anime is really popular. Like, it's just really popular in my area. You see it all the time. It's in the back of cars. It's in every store, no matter if you go to Walmart or anything. It's just, it's a part of our culture here. But even then, I was like, there's no way One Piece is this big right now. And it, it feels like after the live action... It's gotten to the point to where it's getting so insanely huge that when this series does conclude and all those people who said, I'm going to wait until it ends, catch up to it. And all the people who are getting into it through the live action and the wit remake um, end up getting into it. By the time it finishes, there's going to be so many of us. that will be the golden opportunity to create something like a theme park because I feel like One Piece, when it ends, will have that iconic status that Dragon Ball has or even that a Pokemon has, right, or, or Mario, or any of those things to where One Piece will go down as, like, not only just as a great work of literature, but as something that truly impacted the culture. And so because of that, and because of the insane fandom behind it, if they gave uh, a theme park to stuff like, uh, or rides and stuff of that nature to uh, Mario, Harry Potter, all yeah. of these IPs that were extremely important to the culture... I could most certainly see either a One Piece theme park or they make a weekly Shonen Jump theme park and have a lot of One Piece stuff in it, right? It's going to be one of the two. I think anime is getting so big on a global scale, it's almost time for something huge anime-wise like the Dragon Ball theme park. But it's So it's for me, it's either going to be a Shonen Jump anime theme park with a lot of One Piece stuff in it or it's going to be a One Piece theme park that also has like Naruto and other stuff in it. Yeah, I would... that's what we're looking for in the future. I would be there day one. Like... Because I know I went to Universal Studios Japan and they kind of do that already to a degree where they have a mix of Universal rides, but then they also have like anime events and, and things like they in, in Universal mm-hmm. Japan, they had basically a, a baratier. They had a Sanji's restaurant there where you could go in and you could sit and there's these cosplayers I pretending to be the straw hats and they'll, you yeah. know, serve you the food and all that stuff. Uh, there oh, was cool. a there was like a 3D um, or, or 4D hunter hunter thing where you sit in a theater and you get a hunter it was i got to i got to be there for it it was really cool it was so cool like uh yeah they have like all the they had an attack on titan ride that when i went there it was unfortunately closed but i would have loved to be on that so like Mm -hmm. i would i would definitely love a theme park that covered different series from shonen jump it wasn't just one piece but at the same time the one piece theme park itself it, it just lends itself really well to that because you could just make each section of the theme park a different island. Yep. Old Cake and his lobby, yep. Bratier, like it's so many. It's so free. Bono. Like, bro, like mm-hmm. I'm just picturing Easy. like the Sea King ride, like you want a water park section, you have a Water right. 7 section, and then you, or you have a Sea King. Right. Like, you know, it It, it would be so good. And, and I, I would, uh, I, I think that would be successful. Just like knowing how popular One Piece is. Um like you said, man, we're getting into the time where this is hitting the mainstream. Oda said that he wants to make One Piece a global series. He doesn't want it to just be yeah. limited to its one medium of manga and anime. Right. Going to get the live action. Might evolve into getting some movies later. You know, live action right. films. Um, if it does become that global, if he does hit his goal there, I, I would see that being totally within the realm of possibility. So, For yeah. Sure. Sure. Um all right. Well, I think that's a good place to to end the stream today. Uh, I just is there anything that you wanted to say, you know, to to on your end to wrap things up or or you know any any final things you wanted to ask or say before we head off? Uh, just one thing to ask you, uh, which would be, as we close down here with, uh, and I guess for the comment section as well, um, as we close down with One Piece coming to a close. Uh, obviously we have a few more years left it's oda so a few years could be who knows right we 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 don't care because we're like as long as the series is still going it, it will be all right but it's it's 
were almost when when I saw the Gorosei show up like throughout the entirety of the final saga, uh, Divine Departure, the Garp stuff. I was like, when Emu spoke, I was like, oh my god, we're in the end game. When I saw the Gorosei show up, I was like, dude, the series is almost over. <laughs> yeah. Like it's genuinely almost over. So my question to to you, hidden, and to everybody in the chat is, in an ideal world where One Piece. Uh, goes from here and we head off into the finale of the story is there one single thing uh within the the series whether it be in the end game or through a character or whatever it is that you're most excited to see um when i think about that just personally as just to give you an, an example of that even though i can't wait for the one piece to be revealed and i can't wait for the voice entry stuff and all of that because of my connection and my love for Luffy and Shanks and their relationship, when they meet and he gives a straw hat back, if that is able to, to take place, that's going to be such a personal moment for me that I know when that chapter comes out, just thinking about it, just talking about it, it gets me a little choked up. Like yeah. I know it's going to be a scene that is going to absolutely wreck me. And so... Or for everyone in chat and for you, Hidden, is there that one scene that you've been wanting to see from when you first got into One Piece until now that we're about to get very soon that mm. is just, you can't wait to see it? You know, it's it's funny because I, I don't have, I guess, an original answer to this because I'm actually, I agree with you a thousand percent. For me, the entire story is just to get to that moment. Like I know that there's finding yeah. the one piece, saving the world and all that stuff. But for me, I always just, when I think about my experience with one piece, I always just come back to the promise, Luffy and Shanks, mm -hmm. their promise. And the whole story is just Oda teasing over and over. They're going to meet again. They've yeah. never, they haven't exchanged any words since that chapter, mm -hmm. since that first chapter, yeah. there's not been a single exchange yeah, between man. these two characters. And I just can't help but wonder what is what is Luffy gonna say, like once he meets right. him. What is Shanks gonna say right. once they meet? What's gonna happen with the straw hat? Is Luffy gonna give him the hat back? Like like, hey, I I did it. I'm here. I became a pirate as great as you. Here's the hat. Is Luffy gonna go hatless for the rest of the story, or is he gonna keep it? Right. I don't know. And right. and for me, yeah, I'm 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 with you, man. The the most exciting thing in the entire story for me right now is seeing that reunion. Anything else, yeah. you know, if if the One Piece isn't this treasure that blows my mind, and that's okay, as long as the journey to reuniting with Shanks is, is concluded in a satisfying way, the rest of it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be S tier. It can be A tier, right. it can be decent. It, I, I, of course, I want a, a decent ending, but... For, sure. for me, the whole adventure is just to get to really to get to that reunion because that's what that's what set it off in the first place. You know, he's straw hat Luffy. Where'd he get the hat from? It's from this guy. So we got to see that. Right. And um, right. yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I think more than anything else. Aside from that, though, if I had to give any other answer, it would be Blackbeard's story. It, it would have to be, that, he, Blackbeard's probably, yeah. you know, I, I always, my top three changes all the time, but Blackbeard, I feel like he just, oh, he's just always somewhere in my top three. And mm -hmm. it's because of how fascinating of a character he is because of how sure. unassuming he is. Like you don't, you don't look at this guy at first glance and you think this is like the most dangerous person in the world potentially, but he is. He's always a step ahead. He's always planning. There's so much mystery around him. He's the absolute antithesis to what Luffy is in every way, shape, or form. And I can't help but wonder why. Like, like we see the upbringing that Luffy had that made him the type of person he is. His role model in Shanks kind of shaped who he is. But we haven't gotten that for Blackbeard. We've seen him on Whitebeard's crew, and you would think, you're on Whitebeard's crew, shouldn't you take some of those values from this this guy? But he didn't. Obviously not. He, he <laughs> broke the cardinal rule of the uh, of the of the crew. So it's like, where did he get why is he this way? Where did he get this way mm -hmm. from? What's the deal with the D in his name? Because he doesn't seem to act like any other D. So like for me, if it's not Luffy and Shanks, it's Blackbeard because he is the villain of One Piece to me. More yeah, than Emu, yeah. more than anyone else. He is a pirate. He is the rawest pirate in the story. Like, he's the closest thing mm -hmm. to a real-world Golden Age pirate 
that we have in One mm-hmm. Piece. And it's like Oda is doing something with this guy that's going to change the game. That fight, wh- whatever, the fight that happens, the confrontation, learning about what what he's all about, that's got to be easily yeah. the runner up in terms of like, I-, I need to know this. I have to see it, you know? For sure. Um, yeah. But both, it's interesting how both Blackbeard and Emu and their subordinates have gotten the most amount of time dedicated to them throughout the this entire final saga so far like black period has been such a shining shining part of the final saga from number 1058 showing up on amazon lily to then pulling up on law to then sending his crew over to egghead a care business there he's just been moving non-stop and similar things could be said for emu where we're seeing individuals working under him that are finally doing their thing. Like, I, I joke to Ron all the time on stream, but the Gorose have gotten more screen time in this arc than some of the Straw Hats. Like, it's, yeah. it's it's insane how many how much movement has been done on both sides of the of the grand big villain scale. Like, we, all of us expect Emu and Blackbeard and Akainu to be, like, the, the final three. We don't know who's going to get who, or, or, or what's going to go down in what or in what order, but those three being, like, the major focus here for the final saga and the factions they belong to is just so brilliant. And um, it would be one of my favorite parts of the final saga. Uh, to to piggyback on the Gorosei thing and, and for Blackbeard, too, because of the Rock's connection and all that. Um, I am so excited, especially after the most recent stuff that's been going down. More than ever for the voice entry flashback. I, I yeah. genuinely feel, especially after Kuma's flashback, because Kuma, Kuma's flashback surprised me. I knew it was going to be great. I, I didn't expect it to be that. Like, mm-hmm. I, I'm i still at a loss for words for how emotional. I cried every, every chapter. Like, literally, from chapter 1095 until 1102, every single chapter... <laughs> I let out some sort of tears mm-hmm. uh, while, while reacting to the chapter. It just, that's how hard it impacted me. And so when I think of Kuma's flashback, when I think of Odin's flashback, uh, which being the most recent ones and how they were able to mix the hype of the world building of the story with the emotional aspects of both of their characters, I can't even begin to imagine what's in store for us with the most important flashback in the series, yeah. the Void Sentry, which is going to be a mix of everything that makes One Piece so special. I'm, it's going to have those goofy comedic moments as we all expect, but it's going to be the most tragic story. We know we see the after effects of it. No one lives like it's going to be the most tragic story. The emu and them won. We know this mm-hmm. and seeing like our characters, seeing joy boy and Lily and, and uh, Zunisha and all of them fail is in real time is going to hit us extremely hard. Like I, I can't wait for it because it's going to be, it's going to be the Oda flashback of Oda flashbacks. Yeah. But I feel like it's going to be his opportunity to flex um, so many things maybe he hasn't done yet. Because what the Kuma flashback showed me is he still has quite a few things in the tank, even after 1,100 chapters. Yeah. So for the Void Sentry, he's definitely going to pull out all the stops and give us not only the lore that we've been waiting for and the history we've been waiting for, also a flashback emotional stuff and everything that we've been known to expect from the story and it just it has all the ingredients to be one of the one of the best pieces of self-contained stuff that Oda's ever made with all of course all of the uh stuff building into it and everything but i feel like in and of itself it's going to be a brilliant self-contained story that you could even show to someone who's not a one piece fan and be like man i want to get into the series now but if you have all the context it's going to be like oh Bro. man yeah like this is insane so yeah. i i really right next to luffy versus shanks is that voice entry flashback man i, could, I can't could, wait for that could i ask I you something wait. i know I, we, I was just saying that this is the last question or whatever but i do want to ask you this brings up a great question how do you think oda's gonna characterize joy boy when we actually see him on the page we meet him and we actually go through his life step by step how do you think he's going to be characterized go ahead or how do you hope he's going to be characterized? Maybe. Maybe it's a better question. So, I think he's going to be Son Goku. What I mean by that is, I feel like he's going to be, we're going to meet him as a child. He's going to be very Luffy-esque. But he's going to be like a, like a 
another version of Luffy, basically, which is kind of like what Goku is. Um, uh, where he's he's loves food, loves uh, adventure, uh, uh, has no filter whatsoever. <laughs> but and and went around it, it, it uh, unintentionally saving people's lives. Like I, I'm pretty sure he's gonna be like Luffy, where he more than likely started off not caring about any of this stuff in the sli- in the slightest, where he was just doing his thing, having fun. Who knows how he got the fruit, or or how all that stuff ended up, or if, he, if it even was a fruit at the time, or whatever ended up happening there. And he's probably going to be characterized similar to Luffy, but more so like a a, a, a different version of that. And mm-hmm. and because of that, I'm excited for it because I'm I'm pretty sure Oda is going to be playing with the emu Joy Boy parallel thing as well as. Uh, he, he's going to show us the great sides, the good sides of Emu, and the bad sides of both characters as well. And I would not be surprised if, like, Oda does, like, a uh, a really nice thing and shows us parts of the flashback through Emu's perspective, rather than just focusing the entire time on Joy Boy. And, um, because I do think it's going to be presented in a fairy tale like thing. Maybe even the art style could change a little bit to have, like, that little uh, mythical type of thing going for it, which would be really cool. But, uh, in the, just for his character presentation i've just always seen him as like that journey to the west goku-esque character like that Uh, considering that that's what he feels like it is that if if we get to a point in the flashback uh where he gets to the apology and gets to the okay no he's changed from being carefree to genuinely being someone who cares so much for the world that like it but he knows he can't do anything about it now like it's too late mm-hmm. and he's it, it's gonna be it's gonna hit me so hard because it's gonna be like i'm I'm staring two of my favorite characters in the face right now in a mixture of like goku and luffy and we see how carefree he is we see everything that he's done for so many people and then to see how he changes due to his failures is going to be really interesting because then we can have the comparison to how luffy failed when he couldn't save ace yeah Except maybe Joy Boy never had anyone there to help him go through that, which is going to be really, really sad. So I'm, I think that's always how, how he's going to be initially presented, though, as like a Goku esque character I, for sure. I feel like the same way, just because like he can't be exactly like Luffy, because if he was exactly like Luffy, yeah. well, Luffy is going to succeed at the end of the day. So there has to be something about his character that, like, a character flaw that sets him apart from Luffy so that all of this could have happened in the first place. Like he has to fail at some point and his failures have to be the result of some shortcoming. So what that's going to be, is it naivety? Like, is it, um, is it, you know, being too trusting of certain people? Like maybe Emu betrays him in some way. Um, is it being too carefree? Like there's a lot of ways it could go. And we saw that with Odin where like Odin was this larger than life grand character who accomplished great things but he had a character flaw he had some serious character flaws like especially when he was young not caring about his homeland and wanting to go out and see the world yeah he got to go on all these adventures with roger but it's because of his absence that all this bad stuff happened to wano so there's always a give and take so like he can't he can't just be perfect and joy boy just can't just be perfect there's going to have to be something that joy boy does wrong that Luffy's going to have to correct or make up for 800 years later. So I'm, I'm interested to see which character flaw Oda gives to the biggest, most important deific figure in the entire story. Where is the flaw? Like, what is the, what is this, yeah. the mistake? And a lot of real mythology too, like the Greek gods and stuff like that, they're not perfect beings either. They have, they're subject to, to human emotions. They have flaws themselves, you know? Some of the gods are jealous. Right. Some of the gods are, you know, short-sighted. Right. So like, that might be the right. same with Nika or if Nika and Joybo are one and the same. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I feel that, man. I think there's going to have to be some flaw there. I, I love what, Double uh, O F Levant says in the chat. Um, we shout out to him by the way. Great, great commenter. <laughs> Who says he's really he's a really angry boy, and the name is ironic. <laughs> I think that's fascinating because could you imagine? Uh, Joy Boy is like a very angry person. He gets the fruit, and when he initially awakens it, he like that's the first time he really like feels extreme joy. Uh-huh. Like he's he's just been this angry dude this entire time, and like 
once he awakens into that thing, he, that's the first time he ever like he, not even trying to. He just starts laughing. He's like, yeah. "Oh man!" And everybody's like, "What's wrong with this guy?" Like, he, <laughs> I've never heard him laugh in his life. I think that would be a really cool idea. Yeah. Honestly, I like have, like that. a Joy Boy whose name is ironic. I hope there's some like flipping of expectations, you know, like we've been For set sure. up to believe certain things about him. And because, you know, Luffy gets compared to Roger. So it's like there's this will that's being passed down. We expect Joy Boy to be almost one to one with Luffy. But I would love if our expe expectations get flipped around. And it's like there's Same. something that we didn't we didn't totally get from the Poneglyphs or the lore that we're going to mm -hmm. see in this in the in the flashback. Um, but all right, man, I, I think with that is a, that's a really good place to leave it off. Recon, I just want to say, oh, before we do, we got a $2 super chat from Brandon King. Joy Boy's laugh will be boy -yo -yo -ing, maybe. <laughs> It'll be, I love that. Actually, that's, <laughs> that's a great, so good. Brandon, that's a really great idea. I love that, bro. Thank you for that's the, for the $2. Um, that's, that's good. That's very good. I hope that's, I hope that's yep. true. Um, but yeah, man, Recon, I just want to say, bro, this is an awesome, awesome conversation. I really appreciate you for taking the time on a weekend to be a guest on, you know, my stream. Uh, I would love to do this again sometime. I think it's very, you're very easy to talk to. You have a very good way of explaining your ideas. So I think everyone in the chat appreciates that as well. Um, and I just want to, yeah, offer my thanks to, to you for being here. Um, and for everyone in the chat that is not already subscribed to Recon, Please go check out his channel. Subscribe to this man. Seriously, he is a hype master. I feel like he's one of the people that <laughs> when I see his reactions to things, it gets me excited. And I'm already excited just by reading it myself, you know? So please go show him some love on his channel. Leave nice comments. Sub to him. All that. Um, and, and yeah, Recon, thank you for being here today, bro. Dude, I just, I just want to say before we end it, first and foremost, all love to your chat. Chat was awesome today. Uh, brought in some great questions For but sure. to you man uh any anytime you want to do this again let me know yeah. we can run it back and and it's always a pleasure talking to you brother man thank you thank you for having me on cool all right guys well that um that's gonna wrap up today thank you for being here for the first episode of showtime this awesome collab stream i hope you guys all enjoyed it and until next time i hope you guys all have a good day a great night and a wonderful romance dawn take care everybody